We watch anime. We watch anime. I got to start that time. Hello, everybody. We are B and Bird, Bird and B, the birds and the bees. We're here to teach you about the birds and the bees, uh, especially with the first show we'll be talking about. But before we get into that, we got to do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first, starting with housekeeping, I am drinking uh, <laughs> Diamet- Diametric Brewing Company. Two pence in the shilling, Scottish style two, two penny pence ale. Two pence in the shilling? Yeah. That's what it's called? It's called a two penny ale because it used to cost two pennies. Mm. It's 3.7% alcohol. It, uh, when I looked I it up, it was a pale ale. Pen. It tastes good, actually. I mean, two pennies for anything ever. Uh, if only. Yeah, we're going to incorporate a few beer reviews into this uh, episode just because we figure, since this is a seinen podcast, we know that you are mostly adult men. Maybe there are some partners who watch this show with their with their male partners, and that's and why... We're sorry. That's why you're, you're, you're not counted in our demographics. There's been a few girls who've come out to say, like, hey, I'm here. I'm here. We're watching the show. And I appreciate all of you. Um... Uh, but yeah, this this is the fifth episode of We Watch Anime. We're keeping up with uh, 11 shows this but season. only nine this only week. Only nine came out this week for some reason. Now, last week we lost Mashal, which was really sad because the week before it had been our favorite show that week. Uh, and then it totally skipped a week, and this week it came back and it was fine. It was okay. It's like a 7 out of 10. There's a lot of 7 out of 10 this week, which is a little bit of an uptick from last week where I felt like we got a lot of mid. This week's shows were generally pretty good. Heavenly Delusion actually was one of the weaker shows this week. Strange. Even though it was the best last week. It was only one episode of anything this week that I outright didn't enjoy, and I'm sure everyone will not be surprised by what it is. Uh, So, yeah, we're going to be diving deeper into these shows because all of them are like now all the episode numbers are totally scattershot hell's paradise did not air this week uh, oh you're right yeah and that's upsetting the other one was uh fuck it's hard to remember the show when it doesn't come out yeah kamikatsu two of our favorite shows of the season did not come out this week but it's okay because some of the the worst shows made up for it and honestly i'm surprised by some of the shows that got pretty good this week uh, compared to how they've been. And so. also some of the shows that uh, got pretty bad this week. Yeah, well... And, and it's only one of them, I think. Got bad, or... Yeah, right. Has been the whole time. All right, so we're going to start by shouting out our $10 supporters, our backers, because we have two different platforms on which we are getting paid to do this show it's what keeps us honest and on time it's what keeps us thriving and doing for me this is like 20 to 24 hours a week uh between all the clip choices and everything and you know watching all the anime uh getting the stream organized getting it edited you know i listen to the whole thing back so and get all the time codes it's you know it's It's fun it's rewarding but it is a job and it is on top of we do full-time work and we're going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing because it's fun and interesting i think uh we can't really describe our actual job that much it involves we drive around for money yeah we drive around uh and we do we do a very simple job except that you have to drive all over the country to do it um to different locations usually like four times a day yeah Uh, sometimes those locations are states apart in the same day so that's that journey song isn't it here we stand i don't know the any journey song it's not the one song broken into Uh, don't don't stop waving that's that's all i know from journey anyways we're on a journey you know we've been home based in corbin kentucky uh we've managed to do all of our shows from there up until this point because uh, that's where our friends at ASC Presents live, and you know they've they've got a whole studio set up there. So we've just been like popping back in between work, but now we're on like a huge work trip that's going to be lasting us months. So we have to be doing this from hotel rooms. We're very lucky that our hotel seems to have good internet, I'm but we don't know Overwatch. what's going to happen. So if you're not on the edited version of the podcast where we stitch together all the different streams when it drops out, you might not know. Um, Royal Word just dropped us a $2 super chat saying, how did I not know you had an anime podcast? Nice. Probably because it's pretty new. This is our fifth week. Uh, we're, we're still in the process. I haven't actually made like a proper main channel video that's just like, hey, I've got a new show yet. 
Uh, I'll probably do that at some point this weekend since we have some time. It's a three-day weekend because of a, a Memorial Day. So, yeah, we're we're in Kansas City, Missouri right now. It's great. I love it. I'm moving here. We went straight after the last show, after the last podcast recording, which I was planning to edit that night before we left the next day, but it went on for six hours, and then I passed out. Uh, as soon as I woke up, I drove most of the way of a what ended up being like 12-hour drive from Corbin, Kentucky to Des Moines, Iowa. Um, we slept at a rest area for like four hours in the car, then went to work all day, and... Uh, one of the listeners of this show offered, who happens to live in Des Moines, I don't know if he wants us to say his name because, uh, you know, I don't know if he wants to dox his location and, and name. He had private message. I'm going to call him meeting. Anime Badminton. <laughs> anime Badminton. Um, anime Badminton. Bad, <laughs> I can't even say that. Yeah, he invited us out to dinner. At uh, Lua Brewing. At Lua Brewing, which is a really cool brewery was a and lot restaurant. Of very good food. Very good beers in the heart of Des Moines. Uh, and we hung out there for a little while. And then we... They also um, have cool stickers. We had to go straight from there to Kansas City, Missouri, which is like a two and, two and, a, half and a half hour hours. drive south uh, right that night. On the way, we stopped at a rest area and met like a cool traveler dude because he <laughs> had a Japanese van with like right side drive. Um, it was a really cool that he was living out of and we were like we need to know about this van and he, and he was, was like, like uh, 18 grand you know yeah he was like I'm thinking about selling it and we were like ooh uh, this would be interesting he let me like uh, lay down in it to see if I could which was pretty sweet and I can which was it I was, mean it was awesome it was an unbusy enough rest area that we were all long boarding around and stuff so we hung yeah. out there for like a while and then you know, I mean we can say his, his name was Merchant yes yeah, trail name uh, that guy had done the Appalachian Trail, which we want to do eventually. Yeah, but he we're not going to get too off in the we. You can you can watch us go off in the real world on the Picnic Adventure Channel. That's where we usually film like footage of all the crazy stuff we're doing in real life. That is fun. Uh, you know, obviously we don't film everything, but uh, we don't. You know, uh, I haven't been I haven't really had time to edit for that lately because I've been doing this channel so much, which has been a lot more successful, a lot more quickly. I uh, wonder why. <laughs> it's because we watch anime. Oh. So, anyways, uh, yeah, we've we've we were on the road and traveling <coughs> so much that I didn't really have time to edit for the first few days, especially because again the podcast was so goddamn long. But it's out now. Uh, I'll try to make sure I get it onto Spotify by the end of the weekend, as well as this podcast. Again, three day weekend. I have time to edit it, and this is our shortest episode yet, which is why I, I you packed say us at the top. You I packed us in. I was like, I'm gonna, we're gonna have a proper like talk about ourselves and who we are. Uh, we have no idea if this is our shortest episode. It could end up being four hours long. All right. Well, here's our shout outs to our backers. Our back uh, by shout out to the newest supporter that I'm aware of, Last Isis. Last Isis on Patreon. M2 Hidden Music Island and Zero Tsun Game and we also have True Fox 1 over on Back.Buy you can find the links to our Patreon and Back.Buy in the description I'm not going to go into the whole spiel about what those are uh, also we got a $2 super chat from Dash and Scan that says you going to see Spider-Verse 2? Absolutely did you address that other one too? yeah we, okay. we, we, we read that uh, whoops we will definitely see Spider Verse two. I don't know I've if we'll talk about I've been watching every it on the trailer podcast, that comes. We should. If you guys want us to, we definitely will. It's, it's anime, isn't it? It's kind of anime. Uh, we we want to see the Barbie movie when that comes. Which out. Which is also anime, and um, I also want to see Oppenheimer, which is again anime. anime. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you guys want us to talk about IRL animes or whatever, we'll we'll do it. But you know, this is. <laughs> the we watch animation. We watch movies. It's governed by committee. All right, let's talk about Heavenly Delusion, episode nine. We knew this was going to be kind of a slow one right from the start because it's called like the children in, in the, the orphanage or something, the hospital, whatever it is. And we were like, oh boy, it's going to be one of these. But it started off. I don't remember. I think this alien character was shown before in a flashback. Yeah, and like we we're in. I mean, we don't. We still don't know if this entire 
It's been a couple episodes since we've seen this whole, like, school thing, so I had kind of forgotten all of the characters that existed here. Yeah. Um, I had forgotten that they weren't already this young, and, like, so at some point it was like, oh, right, this is a flashback, because this is, like, they're all a couple... These are the same characters a couple years younger, right? Uh, But it was just so surreal, because this episode starts with the alien, like, first frame, and I'm just like, Jesus Christ, have I seen that before? Do I... What is this thing? What is that... Uh, I don't even know if it's an alien. It just looks, you know, like a... I think a, it's a man-eater. She like a gray or something. It. I think it's a her. Uh, yeah, I think they say she. Um, Asura, basically this opening scene, the alien is standing next to the kid who draws and, uh, like, explaining to him that he can do some kind of special thing if he concentrates really hard. And he, like... It's like visual- finding her, right? He can, like... Uh, no, that's later. He okay. he he basically the scene is confusing, so I understand why you probably didn't understand what the fuck was happening because I had to like go back through it, finding clips and figure out what exactly is going on here. The kid uses like a psychic mind beam and shoots a sword of light at one of the other kids and cuts his leg. And it was a really deep cut. Yeah, he okay, like really right. cuts this kid's I leg. Had, it had not been clear on how that happened. I yeah. thought it just kind of happened. Basically, she told him to focus on something and he focused on the kids playing and, and tried visual- to kill one. he well he wasn't like it wasn't I his know. intent but yeah he he accidentally hurt him and then the alien thing like comes in and heals heals the kid um so oh that's tokyo the kid that got hit i think is no the, this is the the no no not kid. not no 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 the the leg. oh the one who got hit yeah, yeah. that might have been tokyo uh so so, Artist Kid, this scene is really surreal and raises a lot of questions because the alien, like, comes into his bedroom and we see from a security camera that there doesn't seem to be anything there. He yeah. is just mm-hmm. speaking to the air. And then the security cameras all, like, fu- get fucked up and the alien, and like, invites like, oh, him. no, the power is out, but it's just the cameras. Yeah, the alien, like, invites him outside. Well, the alien says, I know why I was born, so I've come to say goodbye. Or I found out why I was born. So it uses, like, these celestial wings. With to... man-eater symbols on the wings. Ah, yes. Yeah, the to, eyes. To, like, fly up to the ceiling, just, like, ties, a like, a wire around its own neck, and then hangs itself. And uh, our artist boy tries to save her. Falls, almost dies, but then Asura saves Artist Boy. Yes. Uh, like like a post, like semi-dead, like psychic moment that they have, like speaking to him. So, yeah, this is like the underlying trauma that causes him to start doing the artwork, it seems. Uh, it's why he draws freaky monsters all the time, is uh, this, this suicide of a... But basically we see some scenes of how... Like, leading on from that, growing up, Tokyo ended up developing feelings for him. This is sort of a, you know, I guess the aftermath of where we left them off, where they were crawling into bed together. And uh, it's, it's a, we're going to learn that this is as intimate as it looks, folks, uh, what's going on or what has just happened here. That's no good. <laughs> uh, oh, right, so, we cut back to the real world. Yeah, back in the real world, uh, basically... As our heroes are wandering around uh, the city, an earthquake happens and a building completely topples over. And Hiruko is like, this is a great opportunity to go looting, except that the building has fallen in such a way that they can't really get inside of it, so it's not really that helpful. But a guy comes like crawling out from the other side who's... uh, I don't know how to describe him. I guess I didn't speak. Is, is it the him. guy that comes up later in the episode and has the van and everything? Yeah, the, okay. the, the like dreadlocks. He's like a dude. homeless man. He looks like a. I like guess a, everyone's homeless in this. He world, definitely but. looks like a just a hippie traveler type. He kind of looks like the guy that we met at that rest area that we were talking. about He does kind of look earlier. like merchant. That is, and yeah. he has a similar van. I had yeah, not same type that. of guy. Uh, so. Uh, except that this, and, and also this guy is a merchant, but um, not of the same type as the guy that we met. Now that I think about it, he was kind of trying to sell us a van, so maybe that's how he got his name. Maybe he's just always selling stuff. I've been trying to like figure out how this guy got his trail name of merchant. Anyway. I just figure he uh, spends most of his time bartering to live. Uh, the guy who comes out of the, the, the rubble... 
Um, I don't remember if he immediately pulls out the van, but he basically offers. I don't know how to... he gets the van out. He he has. He basically says that it's not very useful to have because the streets are so fucked up everywhere. So and it's where's just he kind of gas? like a base. Uh, well, you know, looting, I guess. Oh wait, no, he's not getting gas. He just pushes it around. I forgot. Oh okay, yeah. I wonder uh, if he cut out the floorboards. I'm surprised boards. I didn't get any screen caps of all that. Um, there's a scene where we cut back to where the girl with the eyebrows is apparently the only one who can see just like the shadow of the ghost of the um, alien yeah. on the rooftop, which in kind of makes me inclined to think that only certain people can ever see it. Uh, some kind of shared delusion, who knows? Because this episode, okay, here's our guy. This episode is heavily themed on um delusions storytelling lies just damn lies and the idea of things you know of, of trying to get reliable information in a world that's uh, you know so damaged when you know like this guy's lying about most of the stuff he will eventually talk about but i don't think it's necessarily untrue or rather, he's lying about his involvement in it. Yeah, it, it's hard to say how much of it is, like, real rumors that are going around, how much of it is just stuff he flat out made up, um, how much of it is couched in truth, but he's got all kinds of stuff. He's got, like, images from before the fall of animals that don't exist anymore. He's got stories about theories of what happened to cause the fall that all seem kind of implausible. Uh and eventually he will he'll tell us a story that i have some screen caps for um so he claims that he c came from a like hospital where they kept all these kids he, like he's he's describing something that in broad terms sounds exactly like the other storyline the thing that we've been cutting back to the whole show yeah and except it's a little different because like it's a society of only women and the men are sex slaves yeah so well so the thing is he first says he came from one of these societies and then it cuts to a scene of the board members of that place like the actual story that we've been following and they're all like having a meeting where they're appointing the new assistant like chief and uh, it pisses off like a bunch of people who wanted to be the new assistant chief um and then we cut back to him telling the story and he's saying that it's this place that's run entirely by women which like the previous scene has basically already just disproven because there were plenty of men in that scene so as you're going into this like wait is that well but he's is all, this the they're same not killing facility? the men like, uh, they're only killing the outside men. They're keeping all the men they want to breed with. Okay, yeah, that's right. His his story is that, like, every time a man comes anywhere near this society, he's immediately murdered. And they they have, like, this crazy selective breeding process. And he was a part of, like, trying to help this couple smuggle this baby that they had out because they had determined it wasn't going to be, like... But then they killed the couple well, because it was a man. Yeah. And, and then, uh, yeah, the couple's killed. He and the baby escape somehow or something. We don't know what happens to the baby. Yeah, he never says what happened to the baby at the end of the story. And He ends all of his stories with a thank you, bye-bye, right? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Uh, so, basically, after he tells this story... Uh, he has this, like, 11 written on his arm that he's trying to use to To indicate. say that he's he's number 11 of the yeah. breeding stock. Um, and Hiduko quickly comes up and is like, yeah, this sounds like horse shit, and just rubs the marker off of his arm and is like, yeah, you're, you're completely full of shit. And so she threatens him with a gun and tells him to fuck off because she had thought it was suspicious that when he first... Like this, like he, basically they met him outside the ruins. They had walked over to this spot, and then when she started asking for information, he said, "I need to bring my van around." And he parked it very awkwardly in this spot. And she was like, "Why did he go to all this trouble?" And it's because the symbol that is on her gun that she was asking about happens to be directly on a sign right in front of them. And so he realized this and blocked it so that he could fleece them for information until, um, you know such a time as they were to realize he's full of shit so they start actually you know investigating this place because it actually has the symbol anyways and we learn that tokyo's pregnant yeah no actually before we learn this i no 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 no, no. sorry i'm thinking of a different scene that also takes place in this room with mm. these people yeah 
they 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 discover that Tokyo is pregnant. Everybody's like, "What?" They're like, How's that fourteen. Possible? We didn't even teach them the concept of sex. Yeah, like they weren't gonna figure that one out. Like, uh, like you know, like no one ever just but blindly like, discovered the, the way they're talking about before. them. The way they're talking about them is like they're not human. Because mm-hmm. you know, obviously, humans would just figure out how to have sex, right? But maybe they're assuming that whatever these kids are wouldn't have done that. <laughs> Because we don't really know what they are. Maybe they're all strange beasts. Uh, I, I immediately was like, life finds a way. Which is the, the, the Jurassic Park Dr. Grant quote about why the dinosaurs started breeding. So yeah, that was the latest Heavenly Delusion. I kind of expected this to be... Oh, this be... is it? Okay, so hang on. I will talk about that scene then. There's yeah. another scene in this room, and it might even be the same scene. Talking about the board of directors. The board of directors. Yeah, I already talked about that. Where they got promoted? Yeah. Oh, wow. I went through that whole scene. Uh, anyway. Shit. <laughs> yeah, you were a little zoned out at that part. Um, but, yeah, the this this episode, I figured it would be kind of slow and more set up because the last one was so fucking dramatic. Um, and it's another one where, like, we answered a couple questions but raised even more, which has been, like, the whole show. It's very much a show that strings you along with, like, what is going on. I think uh, Tokyo's kid is going to be Maru. or That's his name, right? Maru? The kid? Uh, yeah, the yeah. I think that's possible. That would be interesting. He looks a lot like them, and, um, you know, maybe Tokyo is the one he's trying to save. It's hard to know. Uh, I think this show will probably have a satisfying conclusion. You know, we were we were in. Um, I think it was when we were in. Where did we go to that comic store recently? Was that in Des Moines? Yeah, um, yeah, just a strip mall in Des Moines. We stopped at a place called Marley's Smoke Shop, and they happened to have a comic store in there. So I remember we passed it twice. I guess mm-hmm. on our way to and from the brewing place, right? Yeah. Well, we passed it a couple times in the course of our work. At too. some point, we went into this comic store. And they had another manga from this author uh, that was just like a one oh, volume. Uh, Ellen Horacena is saying we skipped something, and she's right. When oh. they, they, they go to the place with the symbol on the gun and they wander around it and they find more bird symbols. Do you remember this? I. So they find this sign, they go to the place that the sign is pointing to, and they walk yeah. around and they find a bunch more bird symbols. And uh, Maru's like, hey, what if we stayed here? Uh, because it seems safe, nothing's really happening. And. Mm. Uh, Hiroko basically goes, nah, we're not doing that. Seems unsafe. Mm. Let's investigate another time. Or something like that. But yeah, that yeah. was uh, like no, I, two or three minutes of the Honestly, episode. barely remember. Again, I found this... I, I get a little frustrated when a show tells me lies. <laughs> um, <laughs> what do you mean? Be, like, okay, so the guy was telling all these stories, and then they're like kind of provably untrue well and again, so the question i don't I think have the is stories like, are untrue i think he is lying about his involvement in them do you think there's just another colony that is like run by all women and has all that stuff going yeah, on it's it? like the vaults and fallout i think that's possible oh speaking of which we got to download epic games because fallout new vegas is free up until june 1st i mean i guess part of it is to sort of suggest the kind of stuff that people think is possible in this world or like the kind of things that people have talked about like i would guess that his story is like multiple rumors combined Mm. you know like it's the story of the kids in a hospital and also the story of like a feminist uh like you know stronghold or whatever that are like all this stuff like gets conflated and then he adds like a dramatic spark by putting like the baby story in it you know sure like just like he's he's like a bard type you know and like somebody who's just trying to make up stories that are interesting to people that will get them to pay him but like they all go a little too far to be real you know uh thank you bye bye but you you have the suspicion that there's an item of truth in there and it it does flesh out the feeling Mm. of the world they but also find diff- like uh, mention that there are two main facilities of the organization with the bird symbol mm. and seventeen branches, and so mm. that's probably where the show is going to go. Thank you, Ellen. You are the best. Yes, yes. Keeping up where we uh, fail. So yeah, uh, for me, this was like a six out of ten episode. It w- it had interesting things in it, but I am 
at, at being nine episodes into this show and having already had these like really heavy emotional beats, I want us to be starting to wrap up and come to conclusions about things instead of raising even more questions. I do think like seeing the alien suicide, hearing Tokyo is pregnant, these felt like meaningful moments in some way. Um, but I sure do hope something interesting happens and we learn yeah. why we've been cutting back to a bunch of children running around. Yeah. All right. Let's go to the next show, which is The Dangers in My Heart. We have a super chat. Oh, we do. Oh, MNNM with 15 shekel. Thank you. Unrelated question for Trixie. How far into reading Berserk did you get? Saw Berserk in your favorite manga on Mal recently, so I've been wondering. So I read 31 volumes of Berserk when that was how much of it existed in the U.S., which was probably like 15 years ago or something, 2008 or nine. Close, yeah, 14 or so years. So, uh, my cousin Boyd was a huge Berserk, probably still is, but, you know, he had collected all the Berserk volumes up to that point, and for a time he was living with me, so I had all of Berserk in my room, and I read all of it, and it was, you know, it's fucking great. It's really solid all the way through. Uh, obviously, the Golden Age arc is, like, the most memorable, and it's been adapted to anime multiple times. Well, whereas the rest of the manga has been only adapted rather poorly to and only some of it but um i think all of it is really cool and really interesting and says a lot about the evolution of the artist as a person and you know where he was sort of at mentally and emotionally over the course of his tragically short life uh you know i want to finish it now i think i don't know if it's like over over i know that there are people who consider where it ended to have been like kind of an ending in in a some kind of way, but I don't know. Um, I, I I don't know if they're still planning to finish it or if they did. I haven't looked into that. But uh, we have talked about how we really want to do a we read manga side project on this channel. It is not feasible at present. Uh, you know we have a bonus episode we have to record uh, tomorrow talking about, about Bochi, Bochi the, the Rock. Rock we also have to the... watch Bochi the Rock. Yeah, so we have to watch all of Bochi the Rock and record a bonus episode uh, live for our patrons of the $5 tier and above or backed by supporters of that tier because, uh, yeah, like, so already adding that in is going to make enough time that we, we will not be able to read manga <laughs> maybe once a month. No, yeah. Um, but I haven't decided if I want the format to be like this show where we, uh, like read 10 chapters of I think with manga, five it'll be a lot more fulfilling to just pick a manga, read and just what do exists. do the whole thing. Yeah, because yeah. if you, like, so I don't think I, I a guess, weekly manga show would be, there wouldn't be a whole lot to talk about. I guess I'll say that we will do, we read manga like this. We will pick a manga the two of us will read it at our own pace, and whenever both of us are done with it, that's when we'll launch We Read Manga. I don't know if we want to start with Berserk, though, because that's like, um, you know... It's a big I'm, one. That's a long one. Not only is it long, but it's going to be a classic for... It's literally the most beloved manga of all time. Like, why blow your load right at the beginning with, like, the biggest thing in the world? I'd rather do something... That is as important, but for like less talked about, like Akira or Nasuka. You know, it's funny you say Akira. Each. Oh yeah, that fucking Akira gif. Let's go ahead and talk about the next anime, The Dangers in My Heart, or uh, something with the word yabai in it. I can't remember the whole Japanese title. We have some people in our chat or our comments who really love this manga. I really love the show. Uh, yeah, this show is really cute. It's it's uh, it's a darling little heart refresher. I want to say so. It's funny th this episode of this show and the latest episode of Skip and Loafer have us at a very similar point in the relationship. Which is kind of, the of how they've both been the whole time. They're very parallel shows. Yeah, they're similar in what they're trying to do because they both have like a one true pairing central couple of you know in this show it's middle schoolers in that show it's high schoolers and I think that's kind of an important distinction because. Uh, the characters in this show have a lot less figured out. They are, like, way deep in their feelings, in their heads, uh, and the show really explores 
the personalities of the two main characters and everybody else kind of feels like a hazy distant caricature like like we don't understand them that deeply but not because they're not fully fledged out people but because Kyotaro doesn't see very much of them he just only catches like the weird glimpses of strange shit and behaviors they do that he feels the need to you know comment on but mostly he's ignoring them and he's just kind of in his head and thinking about this one girl who uh you know at this point is thinking about nothing but him uh he doesn't really realize that but um she wants that dick skip and loafer is more of a situation where the characters are a little older um there's more of them with more going on who we explore and so we actually get kind of like i don't feel like i know skip or loafer nearly as much as i know these two kids because the show is so fucking zeroed in into their brains in this one um but that show has like more complex relationships more richness in the subtleties of like you know, how kind it of funny. portrays i was just thinking about oshinoko if you had told me that dangers in my heart was written by the same person as Kaguya-sama Love is War, I would believe that so much quicker than Oshinoko. Just because of how this is like a more... Well, yeah, they're, they're both about... Because Kaguya-sama Love is War was all about the, the push and pull. Of, like, these two characters really like each other, but they're deliberately not... Like, they're in this weird mind game of self-doubt and defeating thoughts, and that's definitely where Kyotaro's at. It's less so for... I, I think with... Uh, it's hard to describe Shit. exactly what is the deal with... I can't remember the girl's name. Anna. Anna. Like, I think she's just afraid of coming on too strong because she herself doesn't like people who come on too strong. Yeah. Like, she likes him because he is shy and kind of demure, but ultimately a good person. And that's how she wants to be perceived herself because that's what she looks up to but she's not really like that she's actually really forward and kind of bombastic and like she is kind of horny she's just never you know had a a partner that she could trust that she would express that to whereas you know the the girl who tried to grab her boobs she was like no like this is not what i'm about she's never had someone to share snacks with she wants something more intimate more personal and she has that with kyotaro so like she really wants to advance their relationship without scaring him off by being too forward which the irony of course is that he's going to misunderstand her constantly because in the absence of being told exactly what she's feeling, he is going to assume the absolute worst because he just can't imagine why someone as... Would act the way she is. As exalted as she is in a social sense would ever, you know, fuck with someone as as lowly as he is in a social sense, um, which is all entirely in his mind you know it's just something it's a universe he's crafted around himself of i am the bad guy i don't belong in society people wouldn't accept me and shouldn't accept me even though nothing about his actual behavior really suggests that the show is kind of the artistic conclusion of honey would you love me if i was a worm Hmm. what do you mean by that well you know he thinks he's a worm he's just a little creepy crawly guy he wanted to kill her at the beginning she's so exalted and everything and so yeah like obviously uh normally it might be the woman asking uh honey would you still love me if i was a worm but in this case it kind of seems to be kyotaro um and he's just constantly coming up with reasons that like she would hate him (laughs) yeah i i kind of understand this because i am a self-defeating person and for like I connect with Kyotaro on the neurotic level and even though it can be frustrating for me sometimes to watch him do that to himself I also get it and like it's it's different from Oshinoko where I can say like okay these characters are young I get that they're going to make mistakes but I'm really frustrated by the way that they handle themselves and like the the, the way that they are because it doesn't feel believable to me it doesn't feel relatable this show like everything kyotaro is doing like i might get mad but i'm also like yeah but i would have also thought some dumb shit and prevented myself and like i never made it anywhere near as far into like any kind of relationship as he has with this girl like uh in any part of school all the way through high school like uh, you know, I can remember literally one girl that I even came close to flirt, like this level of we both obviously liked each other, 
but it never went anywhere. So, like, and, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of it on my end was the same kind of, like, oh, but she wouldn't, like, why would she want to hang out with me, blah, 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 you know, like, I don't know how to organize anything, I don't know how to make this happen, so, yeah, like, I get it, I get where he's at, but at the same time, like, what's so exciting about the show is that we know that she is a lot more proactive than he is, and kind of more self-aware, and bringing that out in him by way of being like, hey, you're kind of fucking with me by, like, being the way you are, you know? So, yeah. like, you need to change that up. We'll see more of that as this goes on. Uh, and so this opening scene, <laughs> I just realized I was, like, describing yeah. the whole episode. Uh, this opening scene is that she is trying to invite him to give her his line address. That is the, like, social media app, like, kick, basically, um, and she's trying to be too subtle about it. She asks, do you use line instead of can I have your line? And it leads her down this conversation of she keeps trying to like make it seem cool to him. And he's just like brushing off all of the suggestions. And she's just like furious. Like she doesn't know how to get through to it. It's really cute to watch her get flustered trying so hard to get through to this uh this guy, because from his perspective, he's like, I don't understand why she's being this way. Like, what? She what? rejected that one guy. Yeah, why could she possibly be thinking that, uh, that you know, that would lead her to ask me these silly questions or think I would care about this? And it's like, try to read into it in any way at all, please. She's begging you. Oh, we got some crouching. Why is uh, she crouching? Oh, well, God, re zero. She, yes, this is hilarious. She friends him online because everyone in class is just kind of friending each other. And his profile picture is Rem from ReZero, which I just think is the funniest shit in the world. I just think that's that's exactly who this guy is. You haven't seen ReZero, so you don't really get Oh, yeah, no, I, I, I've i seen this character before. Have you seen the scene? Like, the reason ReZero is so beloved is that there's this one scene where, like... The two of them have, like, an emotional conversation for, like, six fucking straight minutes uh, where he's talking about how much of a pathetic piece of shit he is, and then she basically, like, reassures him. Uh, and uh, it's... That's the scene? Uh, I, it, there's a lot of dialogue in it. I don't know how to summarize it briefly, but it's, it's, it's what made her kind of the most iconic character of the 2010s among otaku. It's and not the so, maid outfit? That also helped. And the twin sister, Ram, which this girl says, I'm more of a Ram fan myself. And is Ram the pink-haired girl? Yeah, the, okay. the red-haired one. I it, guess it, it is pink. It, is that Amelia? Uh, is that, yes. That's, that's the, the one we saw the movie about? Yes. Oh, it's the cat. Okay, so I think I may yeah. have said I hadn't seen ReZero, which is true. I haven't. Right. But I watched the like standalone Emilia Amelia, Amelia movie, yeah, which was the best episode of the whole. It was thing. pretty great. It was fun. Um, but yeah, Ram is actually my favorite girl in ReZero because she puts out. She is <laughs> fucking a dude, which makes her cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, this scene is fun. Um, moving along, eventually it dawns on him at some point. Oh. She was trying to get my line. That's... Oh, I'm fucking stupid. Why was she trying to do that? He's reading the shoujo manga that she lent him and trying to understand, and she he just cannot wrap his fucking head around uh, why. So then the next day at school... Oh, also, I wanted to note this. Uh, the, the In the last episode, I had speculated that the boyfriend girl... Um, was like knew that she was attracted to Kyotaro and was trying to hook them up. I've been assured by the manga fans that that is not the case. She has no idea. She's just uh, totally incidentally. She right? She has no idea. Yeah, she she's does just not realize. Being funny. She's just she just doesn't even realize what she's doing. Um, and I can believe that now after seeing her obliviousness in this episode, because so basically this 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 handsome this... guy. Who has a girl literally following him around. Like, she is supposedly his girlfriend, but he is openly flirting with other girls with her just, like, there. Like an ornamental uh, extra girl. 
Um, uh, real quick. Who says I, nothing. I forgot to mention it, but I have since moved on to my second beer. It is by the same company, Diametric Brewing Company, which is in Lee's Summit, Missouri, by the way. This one's called Lapis Lazuli. It's a dessert-style sour ale with blueberry, lactose, and vanilla. It, uh... Just it's a reminder sour. that even when we talk about shows about middle schoolers, this is still an adults-only podcast. Don't drink, kids, that don't listen to this podcast. Anyway. Um, don't listen to this podcast, kids. Yeah, no. Just, there are none. Don't worry. They're not here. <laughs> oh, right. I keep forgetting everyone who listens to this is older than I am. <laughs> yeah, most of them are. Uh, anyways, so this dude, he is trying to get to... Anna by way of he's trying to get her to come to this party she doesn't want to go so he invites the friend and she is so flattered that she accepts and he's like sure and you should bring Anna too Anna's of course sees through this she's been hit on all the time so she understands this guy is just trying to get to her she doesn't know how to communicate that to boyfriend so she's just frustrated at her uh and it's I just thought that was a really great social dynamic scene to sh- and like even Kyotaro knows what's happening. He's like, yeah, he's just trying to hook up with her. Obviously, I would be, you know, if I was him, I would be doing the same thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, she's not interested at all. So then they're in the library, and he's... I, I don't remember exactly what the tone is between the two of them, but they're hanging out they're kind of awkward and then that handsome guy starts walking into the room so anna just like gets up and gets right up in kyotaro's face and tries to make it look like she's making out with him from the angle that he's coming in from and this kind of scares the the you know the guy away and then she apologizes for getting so close because again she doesn't want to seem too forward she doesn't like people who are too forward as evidenced by this whole episode so uh yeah he she, this is unfortunately causes him to be like an asshole to her for a day yeah so he basically thinks about it and he's like so why is she hanging out with me oh maybe... it's all a trick it's all it's all it's all a lie i'm back to the first episode where i want to serial kill her <laughs> yeah he, he convinces himself that he is just her deflection from all the guys that are always after her uh she he's just using him to keep guys away and he decides to be an asshole about this for a couple of days but then she comes to him and is like hey like why are you mad mad at at me me? what's going on and he's like he has this like she he's trying to like brush her off but then she starts crying and he realizes why did i think that this is the way she like i know this girl i know she's not like that i know she's cool I'm in love with her because she's cool. Why do I keep pretending that I hate her and that uh, she's a piece of shit? Like, I'm literally just looking for reasons to hate her because it's easier than getting hurt by the realization that she doesn't like me. But, you know, she is so clearly happy about him, you know, not being upset with her. So then she hugs him and it's like, oh, they're a couple now. Well, she's like, oh, I'm sorry that I got so close. And he's like, I never said I didn't like it when you get close. And I was like, that's the most Chad thing he's done in this entire show so far. Uh, he's not a Chad, he's a Sigma. He's definitely a Sigma. But it, he, 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 you know, he raised himself from Beta to Sigma in this moment. Um, and then, this scene is fucking adorable. They're walking home. She, she's like, let's walk home together. He's like, okay. She talks about natto, which is fermented soybeans, a you know a, a popular Japanese breakfast that's like a classical thing they've had forever. Um, not popular with the young people. Yeah. She talks about natto for I guess like ten minutes. How bad before... is she hurting to talk about natto? <laughs> well, before he reveals that he doesn't like natto. And uh, she's like, why did you let me talk about it for so long if you didn't like it? He's like, well, you it was hard to cut you off because you seemed really passionate about it. Um, this happens to me. This is this is this is uh, the reason I talk on the Internet is that I spent most of my childhood like <laughs> ranting at people for minutes on end before like I realized their eyes had completely glazed over and they, had, you know, completely moved on to something else. And I go, I'm only going to talk to people who want to hear me talk for three hours on end. And those people 
There's not a lot of them in huh? one community what? in America. Huh? What, uh, what were you saying, honey? <laughs> so uh, then she's like trying to think of excuses to keep talking with him, and he's just like, she must really want to talk about Nato with somebody. And it's like, no, she idiot. wants that dick. She just wants to talk to you. She just give her a subject. Think of something to talk to her why about. Don't, why don't Tell they her what just you talk like. about serial killers? Wouldn't that be like anything? Thing? If he brought up anything she he liked, she would investigate it and learn about it so that she could talk to him about it. Uh, that's how girls work. Girl. Anyways, they end up organizing a meetup outside of school. I think what it on is on December twenty fourth. Um, they were at, they were like exchanging manga. And Anna said she would bring him the next volume, and mm. then she didn't, which is totally a ploy. So they hang out outside of break, so he yeah. can't get out of it. And uh, it just so happens to be Christmas Eve. So if they're not a couple by the end of Christmas Eve, On I will be date. shocked. I'm excited. I mean, as as far as manga, romance manga goes, Christmas Eve is considered a sort of sacred event it is the couple's holiday in can Japan. you imagine how, it is like, a pure romance a, a romance slash kfc themed holiday <laughs> in japan well yeah i mean uh, colonel sanders is saying the Claus, birth of basically. christ is celebrated in japan by fucking and eating chicken that's pretty great um but that being said it is pretty what great. if like this show in the last episode takes a complete 180 and it's back to like like he never actually liked her he was just trying to serial kill her no, and then he commits the perfect crime i don't think that's gonna happen i know i'm sure they'll still have emotional hiccups and stuff and what if what if another but... kid who's obsessed with serial I, I really is... hope that at the very least he is not going to keep convincing himself that she does not like him because yeah. there's so much evidence to the contrary um all right uh, oh so yeah the texting. end of the episode we get to see them texting each other and this is where i'm like like it's it's over now, like because she's able to contact him outside of school. Not he, only there's that, there's no hope. But text people are much freer in text, you know, to like be just uh, <laughs> like a dumber, wackier version of yourself. I think I don't feel that way, but I know what you mean. Yeah, like I think most people, especially in direct text, like direct message, like you don't feel. You know, you're not performing in front of anybody, and you're also kind of abstracted even from the person you're talking to. And, like, you could see a little bit of that in the the little bit of texting we see them do to each other, with each other. I said to <laughs> fucking texting each other. No, the I'm most brutal so crime. hard. Yeah, uh, no, it, it's it's a cute scene. It, 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 you know, it breaks a sort of... Seeing the two of them texting late at night again, it's like they are dating now. Like it, it's hard to think of them as anything but a couple. And I think, I think we're gonna see either some really dramatic way that their romance is tested on Christmas Eve or consummation. All right, what's next? Pokemans. This was an episode that was... could have been half of an episode. Let's be honest. Every episode of this show is very slow. It's very stretched out. And this was one where I literally passed out when we were first watching this. It was the fourth anime we put on uh, on Friday night after work. And I couldn't stay awake through the whole thing. Um, but when I went back through it, you know, you showed me the end of the episode. And then I went and got screen caps. And when I was taking tally of what happens, it's all good. It's all fine. Nothing shitty happens. It's just so fucking slow. Um, it's it's that it, it really fleshes out every interaction between characters, so they're always having a full conversation, and like which is nice. That's not a. It's something not a lot of shows do. I do think this show, for me as a child, I do think it would have appealed to me a lot because it just feels like it's speaking to you directly like you are one of these three kids that they have it's like the central characters and the show is like adults explaining how things work to kids both in a pokemon sense of we are going to indoctrinate you into our and it also universe. kids explaining things to kids that's what mean is a child and the, the three kids are, like, fairly responsible, mature for their age. Like, they're respectable kids, but also relatable. And, like, 
they're surrounded by role models and people who can you know teach them something about the world like this episode mostly is about the fact that the the niece of i can't remember the dude's name the guy who cooks for the whole team, uh murdoch murdoch his niece is the streamer that Liko is a big fan of who is like you know a trainer tips channel that appeals to youngsters and she is a neato thing she, is what go mean literally means i think oh amazing yeah so yeah she's she dresses up in in a neato neato which what neato is she a neato she's a neato arena yeah she's, she's a neato arena costume and uh you know and has a quaxley and does this show and we know that it's the girl who is locked up in her room in the ship but Liko doesn't know this and uh roy doesn't know this so they're trying to figure out how they can get this girl to come out so they can meet her and figure out who the hell she is not knowing that she's also the streamer that they're a fan of and this leads to some interesting interactions that i think are really cute even if again it's so fucking slow it was easier for me to follow the plot going back through like skipping five seconds you know, so I can find the moments that I want to screen cap and just reading all the text as I go through. Um, so the opening scene is Roy is up at night. He sees, uh, I can't remember this dude's name either. Frida. Frida and Captain Pikachu are like doing eating something. Donuts. Well, no, he doesn't see them eating donuts. Oh. He sees them like going into this room and he's like, whatever, I'm going to bed. And they're like, Whew, good thing he didn't come in here to see our secret. And they go with Murdoch over to this cabinet and he's got the, what the hell is the ice cream Pokemon Ma-whip. called? Mawip. And Mawip is like making these batches of exquisite donuts that they're trying to use to lure out the niece but it hasn't been working so each night if the donuts aren't eaten then they just eat the donuts in secret um but i guess it must have worked at some point before he must have lured her out sometime because he keeps doing this strat uh and basically at at you know at brunch the next morning everybody's eating they're talking about how murdoch's food is so amazing but why isn't the niece here i can't remember her fucking name um a dot dot why isn't dot here and they're like well dot doesn't really care about food she eats these gummies that contain a whole day's nutrients to which uh the pink-haired woman goes isn't that our emergency rations yeah aren't those like emergency food but like the i i I like the character they're creating with dot because it's obviously the, the most modern and aimed at like like Liko and Roy are sort of generically everyman. Liko characters. and Roy are country bumpkins. Yeah, Liko's a a a like just kind of smart, kind of just good kid. She doesn't really have the, as this episode goes on, it really starts to establish that her personality is kind of just being normal, like just yeah. getting life done. She feels like she's supposed to have some kind of greater purpose, but as this episode settles in, it, it starts to feel like she's becoming happy just by, like, feeling that, you know, keeping up with everything that needs to be done to live on a day-to-day basis with, like, people who are cool and heroic, like the Rising Volteckers. Um It's sort of like finding value in the everyday. We'll get to that with a screen cap I have later. Roy is more of the, like, I need to adventure to prove myself to find something. Like, you know, Hogator wants to be as cool as Charizard. So he's like the Ash Ketchum Pokemon trainer. Well, Roy wants to be as cool as Freed. Yeah, exactly. He's somebody with an aspiration, whereas Aliko has, you know, she's always kind of been directionless, but she's just happier now that she's with a group of people that she's happy being around. And uh, and then we have Dot, who, you know, we have to assume that all three of them are kind of meant to be equally important because they have the three starters from the current generation. Um, well, just each of the characters is meant to reflect the starter Pokemon's personality, more mm-hmm. so than ever, and more so than just, uh, this one has a water-type personality. No, right. no, like, Dot is literally Quaxley, Liko is literally Sprigatito, yeah. and Roy is literally Hogator. I-, I definitely, when you pointed this out, I figured they probably did, like, come up with the characters based on what they wanted, like, how those Pokemon felt you know uh through the games and yeah like 
Hogator's the bombastic, like, you know, wants the to insane sing, one. wants to go do crazy things, wants to run around and adventure. Uh, the cat and Yahoja, uh, we have to apologize for switching between Japanese and English names when we talk about Pokemon, but it's just the ones that get brought up in the show. We're reading their Japanese names all the time. Um, you know, Nyahoja is just sort of relaxed and chill and, you know, soaking up sun rays and in more of a zen hippie type of a Pokemon. Whereas, and uh, Kawasu is an OCD maniac. Yes, and, and Kawasu being that way, like, you know, there's this sense of above it all that comes from Dot and Kawasu, where, like, they feel like they're shutting themselves off because they think that, like oh, well, I'm just being efficient, you know? I'm just living in the way that makes the most sense as a, you know, as a I am a glad person. that uh, Dot got introduced to be, like, Kawasu's trainer, because for the longest time, we had only seen Kawasu just hanging out with that old guy who fishes. And I yeah. was like, I, I, I chose Quaxley in the, uh, his generation, so I was like, is Quaxley just not going to do anything and hang out with the old guy the whole time? That kind of sucked. <laughs> but, yeah, so I... I, I I feel like uh, the type of person that Dot is, is I, I see a lot of her and the couple of like younger people that I know, um, you know, not even obviously as young as the characters in this show, but like, I just think that Gen Z is very like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna like ignore the rest of the world because I think I know better. And sort of breaking down that attitude in that character is where I think this show's gonna go. Uh, and Liko's going to be the one to do it. Roy is kind of on his own sub-quest in this episode because he wants to know more about that goddamn Black Rakuza. And so they take him into town. I chose the screen cap because it has a sligoo in it. but uh, Oh, it does. I hadn't seen it when you pointed it out. But yeah, that's pretty adorable. There's another shot where he's like, new Pokemon, and it just shows like four or five really cool Pokemon in a row. Why not? Uh... No, I don't think Why Not's in it. Oh, you. This is kind of the, the stuff I was talking about. There's a montage of, like, Liko literally just, like, doing laundry and regular stuff around the ship. Which and Roy just... was supposed to do, but they traded duties. <laughs> and she is gratified by this. She's like, you know, it feels good to get shit done. Um, it's about drive. It's about power. <laughs> Uh, Roy is getting scammed by this guy who's like, I know stuff about Black Rakuza, but uh, if you buy some of my stuff, I might, you know, jog my memory. And initially, uh, uh... Freed is like, uh, no, you're about to get scammed, dude. This guy clearly doesn't know anything. He's just trying to sell you something. But then he's like, yeah, but there was other people who came through here earlier. Some, uh, some guy with, like, two attendants, and they were asking about it, and he's like, I'll buy the fucking thing. Tell me all that you know. Uh, ultimately, though, they didn't learn anything about Black Rakuza. So then, uh, this is the part I really liked in this episode. Liko is watching the live stream. She, you know, she'd been talking to her friend back at school because they're both fans, and they're like all excited about the fact that it's been a while since there's been a stream. And so in this comeback stream, she's doing a Q and A, uh, and you know fielding questions and it just so happens that Liko's question comes up and is... Liko's question is like so painfully specific and very obviously about her mm. that like obviously no one knows that it is yeah. about her but she's like she breaks down reading it yeah she well it, it's that this is normally a advice about Pokemon battling show, and Liko calls in like, there's a girl I want to make friends with. She's always closed off and telling people like, you know, screw off, I don't want to talk to you because it's a waste of time. How do I get her to come out of her shell? And yeah, Dot reads this and is like, oh fuck, I'm seen. What is I'm going on? I'm shitting and farting. Right yeah, now. I'm shitting and farting and fucking dying. And she, like... You know, she she's blown away. Obviously, she has she doesn't know the answer to this question because. But Kwasu just kind of shows up and like gives her a an affirmative nod, yeah. and then Gurumin goes, "It's about Pokemon battling. It's well, just like that. It's just like Pokemon battling. Obviously, uh, just change the environment and try all sorts of stuff. That's her generic answer, which." I think it's really interesting that, like, obviously this the point of this show is that she gives specific information about Pokemon battling. But her broad breakdown of what to do to be um, better at battling... Beatrice, she's a woman. You can just say breakdown. 
<laughs> her 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 in broad terms breakdown of how you become a better Pokemon trainer is change the environment and try all sorts of stuff. Which means that this is basically her general life advice because she looks at everything through the lens of battling Pokemon. It's the only thing she cares about. Nothing else in life matters. So change the environment and try all sorts of stuff. I think that is great advice this. as just general life advice. It's kind of my way of doing things. Is if, if things aren't working out, change the environment and try all sorts of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, that, that makes sense. So... Uh, it's good advice, and Liko is super inspired by it. She's going to try to do exactly that. Then we get... Uh, this scene by itself is kind of forgettable, but going back to it... Uh, so oh, right. So it's the very first time that they're in the show that they go, it's worth battling wild Pokemon, because uh, a fear or a Spiro comes up and is giving Roy shit. Yeah. I forget what it's called in Japanese. It's, I feel like it's been a long time... Since I've seen in Pokemon something that felt so similar to running into a wild Pokemon in one of the games. But it literally is like they go to the outskirts of town, walk like three feet into the woods, a Spearow pops up, and it stands like, you know, that distance away from Hogator, and like they do the attacks back and forth, and it's like, wow, this is literally a wild Pokemon battle. Like the, the most it's ever felt exactly like the video game. That's pretty great. And that's the only thing that's really notable about the scene. Uh, you know, it, 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 I think Hogator wins, right? And yeah. it's like he gains some experience, so like, yeah. He's he's doing it. He's training the fucking Pokemon. He's Hogaten. At the end of the episode, Do- once again, eats the donuts and Roy and Murdoch are initially depressed because they don't have snacks. But yeah. very happy. Not Roy, but uh, um, Freed and, and Murdoch. Oh, whoops. But yeah, they're they're happy that they managed to get her to eat it, and it's because like Murdoch posted on social media that he found some kind of rare recipe. And so that's like the lure that she's like, oh, I gotta try these special donuts, you know. Um, you you mentioned to me that as soon as you saw this character, you thought that they might be trans. Yeah, I mean, uh, in all of the Grumman videos, she has a very feminine voice she's putting on. But the very first time we see her talking, like face to face, she has kind of a uh, more masculine voice, um, and she's just kind of, I don't know dressing like a trans person might in an anime. Yeah, it's it's hard to describe what exactly is the look of a trans person. Something about the fact that she's wearing a tank top but has a flat chest. And granted, I know she's a middle schooler, but like, I don't know. There's something very they-them about this design. Maybe it's the hair, the fact that between her and Quaxley, they have the trans flag colors. Um, I don't know if Pokemon would ever go that far. It might. I mean, Jesse and James. Uh, what James, about them? James in particular is... Well, they're both like constantly dressing as the other gender. Like They're always doing gender bender stuff. James has tits for a whole episode that was cut that out of the American broadcast. I just think that they are actors. They are actors, but I'm just saying uh, they've always had a sort of uh, gender fluid presentation. And um, this character has more of an agendered presentation... I appreciate the like green, like dark green pants with the purple. It's a cool look. All right, that's it for Pokemon. Oh, thank God! Oh my God, my favorite anime. It's back. Oh man, Mashal. It's back. It was really, this week. it was really hard not having this one. Yeah, not having last Mashal week. last week. Uh, at the end of the last episode, he had broken down the door into and, the uh, enemy dorm. He just immediately, uh, you know, the big bad is talking to a doll, and so Mash goes, Hey, you know you're talking to a doll, right? And the big bad goes, Thank you for letting me know. And Mash goes, Oh, you're welcome. Sorry, so, I didn't know I'd work could bro- break the door. This guy immediately just starts basically telling Mash what his deal is. Because I, I think Mash says something about how he wants to be one of the... The, the divine like, visionary. D- yeah, the divine visionaries. And this dude's like, you don't have what it takes. I do, because I want to return this world to its rightful form. I think that this world currently rewards and protects the weak, and that's bullshit. The weak don't need protection. Uh, it's interesting because I had suggested before that Mashal is sort of the Nietzschean ubermensch. He is like just the most like you know perfect man 
in terms of physical abilities. And he quotes Nietzsche occasionally. But this guy is he like... He does? Yeah, because he said God is dead in that one episode, which is like a, like a Nietzsche, originally a Nietzsche Sorry, quote. Sorry, the puppet guy quotes Nietzsche? No, MASH does. MASH does. Mash said God is Mash dead to a teacher Nietzsche earlier. Is. I just think it's something the writer is doing. It's like comparing him to the Ubermensch by having him quote Nietzsche. And the way that Nietzsche's ideology has been twisted by other villains in stories is often like... Or the, in real life, you know, or you don't in have real to say life, stories. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, by his sister. Yeah. Um, I I always think back to Roroni Kenshin, the, the main villain of that, uh, Shishio, his whole thing was like, the strong will live, the weak will die. That's how the world should be. And he has to destroy the government because it protects the weak. So this guy Shishio, he's basically like a, a 4chan meme of the weak should fear the strong. Yes, exactly. And that's what this guy basically seems to be as well. He thinks that it's fucked up that this world coddles the weak. And uh, when he describes all of this, Mashal's reaction to that is, ah, so you also want peace. Yeah. And Because uh, he asks Mash. What are you trying to do? What's your goal? Why yeah. do you want to be the divine visionary? Mash goes, I want to live in peace with my family. So this guy is upset with that presentation of his intent. And he's like, uh, "I'm." those are fighting words. And he's like, I wasn't trying to say that. My bad. Uh, yeah, and my so, bad. Uh, Didn't mean to fight you, bro. And the guy's like, well, I guess I'll let I'll you go. I'll just take your golden coin, man. Yeah, if you give me your gold coin. And Mash is like, well, uh no fuck you that's mine so first he sends the puppet that he just created out, out of silva at mash and mash like foot suplexes it out of the air he grabs it with his feet and crashes it into the ground you know it, it's it begins in this episode but i have a feeling that mashal is about to take an even more big turn for the ridiculous of what it is mash can exactly do oh yeah um well like it's clear, and I knew this from the start, that the show is going to try to become more of a fight anime, and it has definitely done that. Yeah. But, like, because of the fact that there's not very specific powers like JoJo, it's more like, what is the most hilarious way to draw someone beating somebody up? Um, and it's amazing how many different ideas there actually have been, where I always go like, well, that was a pretty funny way to do that. Uh, you know, grabbing him by the feet and slamming his head into the ground. Um, and this puppet turns back into Silva, which is kind of like knocked right? out on the ground. There's a fucking hilarious moment. So he accidentally steps on Silva and is like, "Oh, I almost killed him." Yeah, he well, so he 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 turns Silva back, and then the bad guy sends like another puppet. That's but like it's this, like an ultra jacked puppet. With yeah, forearms. like a forearm badass Goro puppet. I think that, Mash even goes so far to say, "Is like, wow, this one's been doing its squats." Yeah, and it like punches him into the wall and takes his gold coin and flicks it back to the evil guy. And Mash is so pissed off about this that he's like stomping across the room and then he like halts at one point and realizes that he is stomping on Silva's head, almost having broken through it. Very funny because this guy, you know, is still an asshole. Uh, But they're retconning that. But so now we learn he didn't lose his gold coin. Uh, It's it's I mentioned that uh, it begins in this episode the ridiculousness of what exactly Mash can do. Yeah. So he, uh, while it seems like big bad guy got the gold coin, what actually happened is that when the golem took the gold coin, Mash bit off one of the golem's buttons spit it at the coin, knocking the coin out of the air and making the button go towards the big bad guy. And then, with the coin in the air, Mash inhaled with such force that the coin came into his mouth. (laughs) He curbied the coin back. Yeah, I love it. I mean, that's fucking funny. It's a classic physical comedy. So, that whole scene basically is, you know, Mashal had walked away before the bad guy realized that he was holding the button and not the coin. And it was, like, one of his assistants, this pink-haired girl, who, like, saw everything that happened and can't believe it. But then, unrelatedly, uh, the headmaster, I'm guessing for so the it's crime back of to, beating up Silva? No, it's cutting back to the punishment for when he was supposed to be expelled. Okay. And so, he's going like, well, I'm not going to expel you, but I do have to punish you. Yeah, so the punishment he received is that he has to clean this owl coop. Hey, look, 
another Harry Potter reference. It's pretty adorable. They got all these little owls everywhere. These owls will be important later. They're very cute. Uh, so, basically, as Mash is hanging out in the owl coop, the blue-haired guy shows up to try to help him clean up quicker because he's worried that they're going to be randomly attacked by the assholes. And, and they then, are. <laughs> uh, this, yeah, I don't remember the character's name, but the guy from Kingdom Hearts shows up. Um, you remember the guy from Kingdom Hearts 364 and a half no, days? No, I've never played oh, okay. that. One of them has like a giant weapon like this. That's all Real I quick, I, I'm drinking one of these beers that we're reviewing from the, uh, what's it called? Diametric. Uh, this one is called, I cannot fucking read uh, this. Uh, Anyways Shake, I think? Anyways? Is that what that says? Yeah. Oh, okay. it's Anyways Period Shake. Uh, India Pale Ale with Fruit and Lactose. It is an extremely fruity beer. Um, can I try? Yeah, it tastes like uh, like blackberry and raspberry. And... Ooh, I've never had a fruity IPA before. That is strange. Um, it's very tart. Combo of hops, passion fruit, vanilla, and lactose. Okay, passion The one fruit. I just had was a sour with uh, blueberry like blackberry. and vanilla and well, lactose. I guess I don't know what passion fruit tastes like. Like that. Uh, so yeah, this guy's got a big shuriken. His attack is literally called like shuriken. Big shuriken. Shuriken or something like he says like some like spell version of shuriken. And then there's this guy with no lips. Uh, they both look like you know just assholes. Um, and they show up to fight. They've come for the coin. Um, this is hilarious. When these guys show up, Mash is in the process of like drowning because oh, no 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 no. <laughs> The uh, the guy with no lips summons water as part oh, yeah. of his magic. I thought the other. I thought Blue Hair had already summoned the water before they got there, and no. Mash had just like fallen into. No, it. Shark Guy summoned it. Okay, because this is like his. He's setting up his domain. If we're watching Fate Stay. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and so Mash has never swam before in his life, and he's freaking so he's out panicking. while Blue Hair is just like you know having his calm and collected, cool shonen fight conversation. This man turns into a shark. I think his spell is literally like a shark, and then he turns into a shark. <laughs> he um. is full blahaj. He's, <laughs> he's full on, uh, what's his name from uh, from Dead Mount Death Play? Um, Polka. Oh, yeah, yeah he's Polka Hulked is out a shark. Polka, the shark man. Or King Shark from Suicide Squad. Yes, uh, but he's an evil shark. Like in Yo. King Shark is also an evil shark. That's true. King Shark is not a good guy. <laughs> Uh, um, but anyway, so this guy turns into a shark and he dives into his domain, and uh, that's kind of all we see for now. Uh, we cut back to oh wait no. Well, I guess so. They're guess both the, they're both fighting at once. It's like cutting back and forth between uh, shuriken and blue haired guy yeah. and shark and mash. I, I'm uh, surprised I didn't take a screen cap of the shuriken and blue haired yeah. fight. But basically, blue haired guy does not want to attack shuriken man because he he knows he can kick his ass. Because there's so many owls. Yes, he's worried he about the owls. He keeps picturing his sister going, don't hurt the owls, big yes. brother. Yes, he, he remembers that his sister would not want him to hurt animals, so he cannot hurt animals. Uh, and um, basically he beats, like he's getting his ass beat by Shuriken Man for a while trying to protect the owls. And then as soon as like he figures out how to safely... He, uh, he uses Graviol, which is his gravity spell, on a shovel to cut open a bag of feed, and yes. then all the owls go into one corner, and then he immediately kicks Shuriken Man's ass. Yeah, he beats the fuck out of him, and the guy's like, how is this possible? We're both two lines. How can you be so much stronger than me? And he's like, my dedication to protecting my sister is greater than any power level you could possibly have. I um, like how they make it, like, it's simultaneously noble and creepy, because, like, yeah, obviously he wants to protect his sister, whatever, that's that's fine. Fine, that's cute, but like the show but makes how much sure does he want to, protect to his emphasize sister? that he's like, I am a hopeless ciscon. Like it's all I care about. It's the only thing that matters in my world, and I'm disgusting for it. Like, but so anyway, we cut back to Shark Man. Shark Man yeah. has a uh, dove in. He's a uh, he's swimming around. He's like, Where's Mash? Mash just said he couldn't swim. What's going on? And then. Yeah. Phew, Mash Something swims by him really swim. quickly. And he thanks Shark Man. Well, so he's, Mash like kind of does the shark thing and swims by him really quickly a couple yeah. of times, and the shark guy's just slowly realizing what's going on. And then there's like a cut to slow motion of Mash passing him going like, turns out I could swim more than I thought I could. Yeah. 
Um, well, and like Shark hulks out because he's like afraid of how fast. And this he's spell going. is literally like shark but big. Yeah, he. he uh, but then Mash just kind of swims, swims into, into him. him. Uh, you know, he's he's swimming with his fists curled, so he <laughs> beats the fuck out of him. Uh, yeah, they they pretty much kick those and guys' then, uh, ass. And this guy shows up. So yes, uh, a mysterious masked figure. Mash tries to attack him immediately because he seems menacing. Yes, he's like, I'm not here to fight, and he's like, Yeah, but you seem menacing, so I'm going to fight you. And the guy's like, Well, I'm sorry for that, but uh, I have to. I'm just here for my comrades and to see what you can do. Yeah. Um, and so this guy can move really, really Wait fast. Wait a minute. Isn't that the same bottle that blue-haired guy put the other guys in it, yeah, in the earlier episode? I mean, I see. They're, they're reusing yeah. it. Reincorporation. I like it. So he saved his friends. Uh, and then MASH tries to punch him, but he moves. this guy moves so fast. He's speedy. He's sonic. Yeah. Um, he also has a weird eye. It cuts to his eyes behind the mask a couple times. And it's like, uh, I think it's a pentagram, honestly. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway... Guy runs away with his friends, and uh, it turns out his mask cracked. Mash did land a hit on him. Nice. Um, but yeah, so I think that's pretty much the end of this episode, right? Yeah, that is it for Mash. Yeah, it I'm was... excited to see all the... Uh, I, oh, I think they're called like the Magia Lupus or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm excited to see Mash fight all these people. Um, I realize I didn't say this for Dangers in My Heart or Pokemon or... Uh, now we're on Mashal, but they're all 7 out of 10 for me. All yeah. solid. All just solid episodes. Nothing shitty. Nothing offensive. And you know what else was a 7 out of 10 this week? Fucking Dead Mount Death Play. And I gotta say... It's picking up. It's getting good. This is good. a show that would not have even passed the 3 episode test. It is so rare. It wouldn't rare. like pass the five episode test. It is so rare for an anime to get as much better as this one has um ever like if a show sucks as much as this one did at the start it's very rare that it gets as genuinely entertaining as it has gotten and i'm not gonna call it good i just think that it has become so much more like Viogo narita's other stories like bakano or do da 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 and it hasn't reached the height of any of those yet because those shows have just like really great moments where all these things come together and, and create a big splash and i don't know if this show is going to be able to pull that off for a while it's going to need a lot of setup um i think maybe early on this was just a like okay it starts off with the whole isekai thing right it's like literally the trendy thing that's been defining anime for like a decade combined with like this spider-man angle which you know he's the most popular superhero of all time and it really makes me think that like narita started from all right like what are the most popular things in the world i'm gonna combine all the most popular things in the world zombies spider-man isekai uh yandere i'm gonna put all these things together in a blender and i'm gonna see what i come up with and then like very quickly he was like, all right, now let's do super-powered gangsters in the city. Like, let's have them, you know, we're going right back to where we've been. And it's like, all right, you clearly have a comfort zone, <laughs> and I'm glad we returned to it. Because, uh, uh, you know, he, he tried to get out of his comfort zone. Didn't love it. No, it, it wasn't, wasn't awesome. Great. I haven't seen Bacano. I've seen the first episode of Durarara, and that left me um, not wanting to watch the rest of it. That is also a show I would say uh, takes a number of... like it, it, Similar to this one, it starts off such a clusterfuck that you're just like, I don't know what I'm supposed to care about. And then like maybe four or five episodes in, you finally get like a character backstory that is so compelling that you're like, I love this character forever now. And that's when your hooks are in you, you know? But it like... It, it yeah it took a while and this episode is the closest to that in that a lot of this is going to be introducing a new character and just giving them a whole ass backstory which is something that da 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 does for like episodes like four through eight with just different characters um so yeah this this one starts with where we left off uh you know, Corpse God is in the body of a kid named Polka. Polka's in a shark. Polka's whole family is all these rich people who um, 
you know, they've got like this political dynasty or I don't really it's know. It's a company. It's a company. Yeah. They have a lot of money. They've got a lot of power. They're all doing a lot of different things. But the patriarch, Polka's father, yes. is dying. I believe his name is Rosen. And he had been talking to Polka in the last episode before um, the fireman showed up to try to kill the twins. Um, that he was beaten back by a zombie girl who had originally murdered Polka, but is now friends with him. And and it's Demon Man. a complex show with a lot of yeah, a lot of moving things. parts. But 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 we kind of in at the start of this episode is basically a resolution of everything we've done so far. I would say it didn't feel like we were in an arc until that arc suddenly came to an end and yeah. kind of answered all the questions that had been left hanging except for one which is why did they why was polka supposed to be killed in the first place yeah. we still don't know who hired and like part of the mystery in these last few episodes was well, like was it his family it's kind of and, alluded to rosen pretty much alludes to like you know i would i would never hope it was someone from my family that wanted to kill polka but i'm pretty sure it was I still, th- I feel like it's mysterious because they were trying to make it uh, like seem like, oh, it's his brother, the 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 brother who hires, but it probably I'm pretty wasn't. sure it was. I don't think so because he's the one who saved the the kids in this episode. Ultimately. Well, he doesn't want to kill them. Okay, so it's just Polka. It's just because so it wasn't Polka. I think uh, it's something that is alluded to or uh, outright said in the last episode. Uh, Polka is the son of this old man. Right. And he is way younger than almost everyone else in the family because yes. they are all the sons and daughters of his only other son. Okay, so that guy wants to kill Polka so he can be the new, like, uh, oldest man in the family who will take over. That makes sense. Um, so, yeah, they're kind of... I, I would say, yeah, that in that case, pretty much all the questions are answered by the end of this arc, except for, like, are there more than one Lemmings? What is going on with Lemmings? Um, did they, did they, did he, did he, I mean, it's possible that we're supposed to just infer that Lemmings escaped from that previous scene where they didn't fucking show anything and it's implied that they had killed it, but whatever. Uh, anyway, they had fought off the fire guy, that guy was murdered by some other, the actual fire bug, and, like, it's very clear that the next arc is going to be about the fire bug and this new character that gets introduced and everything else that we've seen. You mean the Phantom Solitaire? Uh, you know, the, the best character? The cops are going to be trying to keep up with them, and that's the plot now. Like, all the other shit, everything else, there's also the background hanging element of the whole world that the corpse god came from but that doesn't seem to be well, relevant it's alluded right now. to for the first time yeah I, well maybe not the first time but they talk about it in depth they bring yeah. up the calamity crusher and so it's like oh is he coming is he coming are we gonna get more of it? It, it, it so this scene where they're sitting with the dad and um basically what's happening in this moment i chose this shot because i like the way the sword behind him looks like it's attached to his waist but it's just like sitting behind him somewhere uh, they've got like ninjas underneath the house listening in on the conversation, and Corpse God's like, "Could you send them away?" And he's Can I have like, some "Privacy." Yeah. Um, we cut. Uh, so here we go. Hot take, flaming yes. hot take. Lemmings is the most kawaii character in this show. Um, the cutest. It, Lemmings is just adorable. I I love Lemmings. Lemmings Good is like him. shaking their head, you know, doing expressions. Well, Lemmings they don't talk, so they can yeah. only communicate through adorable expressions. This is basically the same thing as Selty from Do Da Da Da, the motorcycle uh, headless oh, right. horseman, because she has no head, so she communicates only through text message and expressions like this. I still am theorizing that I think Lemmings is going to be a woman, but you know, we'll 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 see. Um, yeah, this scene is basically just like, hey, good job protecting the kids. I, I, I felt kind of stupid, actually, because in the last episode I was like, well, why did Lemmings show up out of nowhere? Like, forgetting that Lemmings just works for the brother. Um, so obviously he sent them. Uh, so basically this whole scene, the dad is like a kind of respect corpse god guy, but this other girl apparently fucking murdered my son. So I'm going to, you know, I hold a sword at her. And then fucking uh, Blahaj jumps out of he corpse bl- god's he, shirt. He blocks the sword away and he's like, no, dad, please, please don't, please don't kill it's him. It's really cute, the, the way they adorable. animate uh, Polka in this whole scene. And yeah, the dad is like, wait. 
my son defended a, a dog at one point. I like think it was this. the alligator. Oh, it probably was the alligator. You're yeah, right. He, my son begged me not to kill something at some point. Are you Polka? And he realizes it. And Polka seems to be enjoying being Blahaj. So he's like, you know what? I'm okay with this. Uh, she even apologizes to Polka and puts him in the boob. Uh, I wish prison. you had gotten him blushing because it is cute that the plush can yeah. blush. Um, but yeah, plush can blush. I think as, as as this scene was happening, she was like holding him out in front of her, and both of us were like, "Put him in, in your, your boobs. boobs!" And uh, she did. I knew she was going to. I was like, "There's no way she's not about to slam him in them titties." She is very open. She, you know, she does not mind giving some titty away. She's no. that type of girl. Um, and and the, uh, the the ghost spirit that had been all ugly and yeah. twisted from being killed by the fire guy, uh, she's happy now because the kids peace. are protected. Uh, she's still around though. She's and, uh, not, she's not yeah. gone to heaven or anything. Zombie she's just girl, still there. zombie girl asks, "Are you going to make a contract with her?" And Polka goes, "Not yet, but soon." Uh, and they also meet the alligator that the that Polka had defended from. And his this dad. causes Corpse God to go like. I think Polka, he was like kind of a kind of a big guy, kind of a cool yeah, dude. He Pol- kind of knew what he was doing. Polka was a little bit of a badass. Maybe that's why he has such cool hair. The alligator's pretty sweet. Uh, so this, all right, so this is where we get into. All right, there had been this dude. I don't know if we had his name's Phantom Solitaire. Um, they were interviewing him, the cops, like during the whole. He is a last troublemaker episode. that they had captured, yes. and so he's been kind of uh, just like helping them out. You, you know how in Psychopaths, there's the, there's the uh, contract. No, that's the that's dark. The uh, the the fuck enforcers. You, yes, the enforcers were the ones who had been. Like they had too high of a psychopath to exist in society, but they can catch other ones. And some of them are in prison, but they still come to them for advice. And he's like that guy. He's in a straight jacket. They're like asking him about what's going on with the firebug. And then after he hears that the firebug like killed its imitator, he just decides to escape from jail. I guess he has found something interesting to do. And after this happens, the cops basically sit around and tell this man's entire story. They're like, this guy, he's sort of a magician, uh, but he claims that he's going to prove real magic exists. And uh, also that he's going to commit all kinds of crimes. Um... At some point, he, like, hijacked all the TVs in Tokyo. He kidnapped the prime minister, I believe. He kidnapped the prime minister, and then to prove that it was not a political move, kidnapped the leaders of every other opposition party as well. Yes. And did not take them anywhere, didn't hold them hostage, just dropped them off at a cafe and let them read the first uh, volume of Murcielago. I, this is so... So I own this. I own the first volume of Murcielago. Uh, Bird doesn't remember it, but I had him read at least some of it at some point. Um, this manga is about a badass mercenary woman who's a huge lesbian. The manga starts off with her like just fucking a girl and shoving a phone up her hooch um, before she goes out on a mission to murder a bunch of people. She's kind of like Rick from Rick and Morty if he was a mercenary and just like, um, you know, out there to, to cause chaos. Uh, it's a really fun manga. I've only read the first volume, but the fact that it was brought up here, I could easily see why this would be like Ryogo Narita's favorite thing. Um, I don't know if there's any actual connection. The art definitely doesn't look like this show's art, so... Yeah, uh, I just thought that was a really fun, fun thing to come up in the middle of fucking Dead Mount Death Play. And apparently, the Prime Minister, his only quote on having been kidnapped was, "It, it was, was a blast. blast." It's not clear if he meant Murcielago or the experience <laughs> overall. Corpse God buys a um a a, a radio from the early, uh, late eighteen hundreds and thinks that it is a m- marvel of modern technology. Yeah, it's pretty adorable. I do. This show wins me over with the stupid, goofy faces, because like it's so inexpressive normally, but then when they go into super deformed mode, it, 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 at least there's a little something. It's cute. I mean, I. This show... Look at how happy he is about having that fucking stupid radio. This show was so bad at the beginning that we started this show about it. 
Yeah, no, we started We Watch Anime to rag on Dead Mount Death Play. And, and now it's good. And now it's actually pretty okay. So, uh, you know, guys, it's been it's a lot of fun. We, we've had a good four episodes. <laughs> five. We're on episode five. Oh, shit. No, we still have a show to rag on, so don't worry. Oh, okay. There's still something we're suffering for oh, the right. sake of uh, shitting on. The, uh, the Office MILF gets introduced. Yeah, I don't know. This is definitely a G-MILF. Um, I don't know who this is for, but I appreciate it. I'm glad that you gave them. It's for Pose what Law they need. on Twitter. You know how few G milfs there is in anime that are this adorable. I mean, just replace the head with a young woman, and you've got a uh, ten out of ten. So this is where this was the exact moment when I went, okay, this is now like possibly even more preposterous than. <laughs> Do that so or not. They go, uh, the, uh, the I fan- mean, that show had a dull hand, so I can't say that, but it's, sorry. So the Phantom Solitaire breaks out of prison, and um, it, it cuts to everyone watching the news or listening to the news in some way, shape, or form. And the cops are like trying to channel surf, but they notice, oh my god, every single channel is exactly the same with the same guy. And at that moment, it reveals that the reporter on screen is the Phantom Solitaire, and he's going to resume his crimes in one week. And, uh, you know, the cops are like, hey, how did he do this? How, how is he taking over and, and the waves? Like, it must be the grocer. He probably just bought the airtime from the grocer. And they're like, the grocer's in prison. I thought the grocer was in prison. Doesn't Look matter. at his prison cell. Doesn't matter, you know. He, he just does whatever he wants. He has a storefront <laughs> in his prison cell. On his... Pr- who is the... Who's like, the grocer? <laughs> well, not just who's the grocer. Okay. Who's letting them do this? Who would... Who is the... Who's purchasing things from the actual storefront? Only guards, right? Prisoners can't be coming up to his cell and buying things. Like, he's at a level of audaciousness, of of freewheeling. He has bought everyone to such an extent that he can sell things directly from his prison cell. Apparently, Um, he made a deal with the government. Every once in a while, an artist comes up with an image. Maybe he's not the first one. I'm sure this isn't the most unique idea or image in the world, but just looking at it, I'm like, God damn it. That's really fun. It's really oh, fun. The, just the prison just cell the with the... Just the idea of it. Like, I think uh, the closest thing I can compare it to is JoJo Part 5 with the big fat guy in the Pol- well polpo yeah yeah, yeah polpo. well there's also part six that literally takes place in a prison and has all kinds of characters like that that's true it doesn't have one that has like a sh- like 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 a storefront yeah like polpo was like inviting people to come to his prison cell so he could initiate make them, them into have, the gang yeah stand powers and this is like but this is even more like forwardly because ju- you know in that show, like, the cops were in on it to some extent, but they were still trying to keep up the appearance of that they're, like, you know, have this guy detained. This is, on the face of it, preposterous. Like, it's so flagrant that it's, like, no one can can say anything about it. Uh, I just think it's amazing. It's, it's, it's really fun. This show is crossed, like, there's a certain type of anime... Uh, there's a, a a certain magical index is one of them um or like jojo or uh there's one that comes to mind this weird ass show called the book of bantora where it's just like non-stop the craziest idea the author could think of and nothing else and i really hoping that's what this show is evolving into is that it's just gonna be like all right fire safety umbrella prison cell with store in front of it a magician who uses like you know fake card magic except he's actually using real magic no he's not uh, no 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 he's very he's okay very... but he's trying to prove that real magic exists when he's right? trying to send out a signal to anyone who can prove who that can real, magic real magic is real so okay. that he can learn how to use real magic also see, quick aside did you know that fiddler on the roof is the biggest American musical in Japan, and it's like loved. It ran for fifty years. I didn't know It outperformed know that. every other American musical. I didn't know it was American either. Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah. What? Of course it is. I, I guess I just thought it. Isn't must it? Be isn't it like, like about Israelis. American Jews? Well, it takes place in Israel, I think. It does. I'm not sure. I don't know. I haven't seen it. Me neither. But I've heard the so, songs. So, uh, as 
the 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 characters are hanging out at home and the the conversation once again returns to how there's so many different creatures in the world that corpse god comes from it's set in russia okay uh as compared to the basically someone asks him like aren't the, you know back in your world weren't there any like massive heads of state that had built up or ma- rather massive enemies of the state that had built up names for themselves and right before the scene that's on screen right now i was just screaming at the screen like him literally yeah, him he, he is was a the massive guy enemy of state. and he never brings it up he brings up that he thought he might get attacked because one of these things was attacked but he never mentions himself being a massive enemy so of basically the state. we've got uh Ladile, the slime witch um, I can't see that There's guy's the name. There's the Pirate Mare. The Pirate King. Uh, or Mare, no, yeah, yeah. No, it's the Pirate Mare. The, Silk, the Highborn Vampire. There's, uh, there's the, an Invisible Golem. Yeah, the Legion of Invisible Golems. No, it's just, a, no, it's no, just that, one look, Invisible all Golem. all of those guys are Invisible Golems. No, it's just one guy. But this this is the... I know, le- but it's because you can't oh, see him. Oh, you're saying this one's the Invisible One and all these ones are Visible Golems. I mean, the ones that are... So there's vis- an arrow pointing at that at that guy so maybe that's the invisible golem i'm just pretty sure you can't see the invisible golem those are just people okay anyway then there's a uh, pani the alchemical scholar of the floating workshop and of course we've got a zombie girl like i want to learn more about silk sun the vampire girl which is cute yeah i i i i think it's really funny that she doesn't verbalize this it's just text that is on the screen but she does make like a ah sound um uh, Anyway, yeah. He never left his coal mine, but he did hear some rumors. So, basically, Um, he says... Phantom Solitaire... Wait, wait, wait. At the end of that scene, he says, um, some of the stuff from my world does exist in your world that you consider to be fairy tales, such as... Fire ele- elemental spirits is what he says. There are elemental spirits in the real world. So the approach this mm. show is taking to isekai fantasy world invading our world is, yeah, but our world already had secret magic. And I think that is really where we're getting to, like, magical index levels of, like, okay, there's all kinds of different fucking magical shit going on in this world. And, yeah, um... You were saying that Phantom Man... So, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Phantom Solitaire. Uh, he is on a roof. He's meeting with one of the fire-breathing bugs. We know this because he's holding an umbrella that says fire safety. Um, and he's basically like, hey, I've got a proposal for you. And fire-breathing bug uh, just basically starts trying to set him on fire immediately. Yeah. He's not, uh, And Phantom Solitaire goes, you're not even going to try to hear me out. You're just going to set me on fire? Really? Um, and fire breathing bug goes. How'd you find me? And then just keeps trying to burn him to death. Yeah, um, but he's and, just uh, dodging all of his moves and continuing the. Conversation. They get into a huge conversation about like the meaning of life and what what purpose itself is, and it's it's a little confusing and drawn out, but it's fun. It's a fun conversation. I, I don't remember if this really. Has I don't a think it has a resolution. Ending, yeah. I think he just disappears. And we kind of cut um, back to the the main house, and like they hear a knock on the door. They open it up, and, and it's Polka's uh, family, and they've brought Polka a big is, blahage. Wait, is that not? Is that's it, these are Pol- Polka's family. That's um. Oh, those that's are the, the girl two that's girls obsessed who are at with the, the shark. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. She looks a lot like the sword girl. Yes, she does. But um. Uh, yeah, anyway, so right, they bring the Polka, family. an even bigger shark, and I really hope Polka gets to inhabit the giant oh, shark now. I just, I think it's so adorable the way they staged this scene with Polka down there, like, whoa, big shark, like, hey, my family's here, like, you know. Every, every, all of Polka's shark reactions are fucking adorable. They are. Pol- Polka is the also, best. Also, you didn't get a screen cap of Polka talking to his dad because that was pretty cute. And I'm disappointed. I wanted people to see it for themselves. Uh, yeah, that was a uh, seven out of ten. It was a shockingly solid episode of Dead Mount Death Play, um, which is good. Uh, next up is Magical Destroyers, and this was this okay. Is pretty much everyone's like, well, what do we do now? Everyone knows about us. We're not really fighting like a rebellion. It wouldn't make any sense. What, what's what's going to happen? What the, I would give this episode like a 6 out of 10 because it had some interesting themes once again, but uh, the presentation was confusing and fuck it all over the place, and I spent the whole time still not sure whether anything real was happening until I went back through it. It was exactly... Oh, man. The way that this show is presented, 
I feel this episode in particular, I feel like will be difficult to fully relate to and parse if you are not the type of person that would make this show, which is a weird thing to say, but this episode feels like it's about how this show came to be. Yeah, a little bit. Because the previous episode, we ended with, uh, it was suggested to Otaku Hero, what if you put on like a big event to celebrate otaku culture that everybody can participate in and i thought it sounds kind of like a trap um but they decided to go through with it so this episode starts off with the meeting where they're trying to figure out what they're going to do about this big event which is called like wanku which i'm like i don't know if that means anything in japanese but it sounds like it's just called the wank festival I think that's like wanku, the, yeah, yeah. I think it's supposed to be the Wank Festival, which is particularly fucking funny. Yeah, it's pretty adorable. Um, they're figuring out what they're gonna do to make money or to I don't know solidify their place. Anything. They have no yeah. idea what the fuck. They have to do. no forward motion. Uh, the uh, pink steps up, and you know, as usual, <laughs> gobo 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 gobo. The magical girls are watching these guys try to come to any kind of decision. They're just like these guys are fucking pathetic. They're otaku who've never taken once the lead to get anything done. They are never gonna be able to figure this out. Meanwhile, our guy otaku, otaku hero, hero is kind of having a depression fit I he's think. just like sitting in the corner silently uh drawing to himself oh, he's taking notes so that yeah. no one calls on him i think that well that's the joke they make is he's like the kid in the back of class who like doesn't get called on because he looks like he's paying attention and taking notes but ultimately he's just sitting there uh so everybody finally turns to him and they're like you need to tell us what to do you're the leader you you figure this shit out i need an otaku hero and he reveals that he has written on this slice of paper uh way too small of a slice by the way not nearly big enough <laughs> he, he just writes down like show everyone how much you like the things you like um and this is what they all decide to go through with now <laughs> This episode gets really weird from this point forward, but I can summarize it thusly. Otaku Could you just summarize Hiro, it briefly instead? Otaku... <laughs> instead of thusly? Yeah. Otaku Hero has a lengthy mind-tunneling vision about what this event is going to be. And first he imagines it through a positive lens, then he imagines it through a negative lens, questions which one is the one he, like, which one is going to be the reality he inhabits after he does it, and then goes through with it. It's, the way this is all presented is deliberately confusing and kind of mindfucky, but I also get it as somebody who has created a bunch of things, and I see how this, like, so what they're trying to throw is a big celebration of otaku, of the idea of otaku, of everything they stand for. How do we make that happen? Which is weird because the government's already doing this. They're already celebrating otaku. They have like whole exhibits for them to hang out in and people to come appreciate. But they the only let you do it under their terms, I guess. It's I really wish they'd established more of like exactly what is the difference between living as an otaku in the zoo and living as an otaku outside of the zoo. Uh, I don't know if there's just behavior that the government cracks down on. Like, maybe you have to be an otaku within certain parameters. Things that could have been better established, considering the themes of the show are about being able to do whatever you want, and that's most of what this episode is ultimately going to hammer on about also. But, yeah, so... The main thrust of this is... You know, I had to think Magical Destroyers is itself a big celebration of otaku. So I'm imagining a room full of people sitting around trying to come up with an idea for how they're going to celebrate otaku, turning to Jun Inagawa, the show creator, who's sitting in the corner drawing quietly by himself and going, what do we do? And he says, you know, shout about how much you like the things you like, and then imagines how that's going to go. Uh, so, this episode, he, Otaku Hiro suddenly becomes producer man. He jumps straight into producer brain. If you've seen a lot of anime about how anime is made, stuff like Shirobako or uh, 
for a funny example, girlish number. Like producers, they're always super gung ho. They're always like, we're gonna just, you know, if you have enough passion and hard work, it's just gonna work out. You know what we need to do? We need to make this a multimedia franchise. We could have manga, we could have the movies, we could have everything. Songs. Merchandise. Oh, we don't have the funds or the know how? Well, it doesn't matter. Make it happen anyway. Yes, we'll do it. We'll do it. And I got to say, uh, you know, I have a bad case of producer brain myself. I'm a creator, but I am also my own producer. So every time I create something, my producer brain goes, well, like, how am I going to take this to market? What is the most advanced way I could do this? And so, of course, I'm immediately thinking, well, like, well, what would I think is awesome is if there was a movie and a tie-in book and also a video game that I could play that expands the narrative and if there was a card game tie-in. And I start planning out how all of that is going to happen before I have a story or character arcs or you know like and things sometimes that make people care those <laughs> stories and those concepts you come up with don't really get to that point of no character oh, they arcs? never get to that point the thousands of ideas i've had for massive multimedia franchises almost never reach the point of having a story or a character arc that i can base them around but yeah, no, that is, that is a, you know, creative people understand that you can have a billion ideas that none of them make sense as a marketable idea. And uh, the producer's mentality is I just need to find an idea that I can bring to market. So, you know, uh, uh, just this whole section of episode was really funny and really relatable just as most of it is otaku hero giving producer rants it's like him being interviewed uh about why he's doing the event and it's all like well you know i just saw the passion of everyone involved and i i couldn't think of a reason not to do it i mean personally it, you know none of it would have been me it's just because everyone else is so invested uh and like he just kind of vague talks his way through, um, you know, amassing the ability to do this thing. But then he's, he's like, he's, you know, we see all these scenes of him setting everything up, picking the location, meeting all these people, like all these artists who've been secretly in the underground, who have been waiting for something like this that they can perform at live, you know. Everybody's all like, yeah, this is going to be so cool. But then... He's going out on stage to do the emceeing, and he slips on a piece of paper, the piece of paper that he originally wrote the idea on. He face plants. He looks around, and no one is there. It's all empty, and he's like, what's going on? And then he hears the voice of Blue, and she's, you know, the, the girls are like, what are you doing? You're talking to nobody. And he phases back and realizes... That the last, like, five minutes of what we watched have been, like, his dissociative fantasy of him projecting what would happen if this is the angle I chose for how we're going to do this. So, um, ultimately, where he had slipped up is as the MC. Somebody asks him, like, are you feeling nervous about having to, you know, be the MC of the event? And he's like, no, of course not. It's going to go great. But he is nervous, and so the magical girls come to him in his head, and this really reinforces my idea that they are just, like, aspects of his personality. Yeah. Like, the voices in his mind, and they all kind of come to him like, is this really the time to be even doing something like this? Like, there's bigger battles to be fought. Is this really the time for a celebration of otaku? And this is to me represents probably the self-doubt that Jun Inagawa was having of creating a show like this like which you know my first impression of this show was wow this is a weird time to be like making a 2008 style like otaku are great let's celebrate otaku culture type of show and especially one that's so modern and so weirdly divided from like the time and place it's commenting on and uh I've forgotten to mention this in the whole fucking long ass four hour seven episode uh, review we did last time with shaves but uh last year 
or I guess it was towards the end of 2021, there was an anime called uh, Rumble Garandal, which had a very similar premise. It also was set in Akihabara, where there was like a post-apocalypse because the government was cracking down on anime stuff. That one had Mecha, and it was pretty solid. Like I watched the, I only saw the first episode, but I really enjoyed it. And when this show, when I was watching the first episode of this show, it felt like it was just like total retread of Garandal. Um, and I forgot to mention it. Somebody brought it up in the comments. From where this show has gone since then, I don't think it's probably that comparable to that show. But um, that was the only example I could think of of something that <laughs> was even remotely close to, you know, like this level of like yeah otaku culture like appreciation and like that show is a failure so i don't know why they thought this would be a good idea but it is it's great i would like to mention earlier in the chat someone asked isn't bird the guy who made magical destroyers no i am not what why do they think that i don't know that's an interesting thing to ask i Uh, think it was a joke i'm pretty sure it was ellen oh okay um, so, the, the scene of him, like, talking to the girls, basically, it's, it's suggesting that there are two possibilities for how this whole thing is going to go. Either everybody's gonna turn up, and it's gonna be a big fun time, and they're all gonna feel great, or... They're all gonna die. Uh, yeah, or, well, just no one will even care. It seems to be his bigger concern. Because ultimately, why he convinces himself that it's worth trying anyways is they're probably gonna die one way or another. Like, if they throw this big party, yes, the government's gonna notice, they're gonna show up, they're gonna start a fight, and maybe they're all gonna go out. But that's all probably gonna happen anyways because they're already, like, a resistance that's on the, you know, the low end, like... The best chance they have is going to be reinvigorating themselves, trying to, you know, trying to fight, trying to have some kind of last show of uh, self-appreciation and just ultimately doing whatever they want because it feels good, man. And so he decides to go through with it and they do, in fact, successfully throw their big concert. Uh, they've got all these, you know, otaku artists perform and then Otaku Hero himself performs sort of a slower acoustic song it's all right it's fine it's a song at one about point he sings in well. english everything happens for a reason as yeah. like the stage is getting blown up i think that was one of uh dick's biggest problems in the universe on the old show yeah. was people saying that phrase uh it's then like it is what it is the uh the magical girls put on a show and i actually really liked their show because it's just this like grimy gritty very live sounding um like heavy metal idol performance and i've complained many times in the past about how like there are idol anime that make it sound like they're in a studio and they're supposed to be doing a live performance this did not sound like that this sounded hella live i loved the performance the girls gave i liked the lyrics i liked that they were like starting a mosh pit and screaming at the fans and uh yeah it was just really cool the show overall has a really good soundtrack and really good music, and all of it was done by a dude who doesn't seem to have any other credits in anime, so I don't know who that is, but good job. Um, and this episode ends with, so they've put on their successful concert. No, and then the little girl shows Even up. Even though they got attacked by the enemies, the enemies ultimately ended up like joining in the concert and just, like, it all became a cool Yeah, the TV party. guys, like, headbanging and stuff. He's having an okay time. But then, yeah, like... I believe that it's like it, like a dude comes on stage, but then pulls their head off, and it's a little no, no, girl, no. and then the head is in the girl's hands. Or oh, something. maybe. And then, and then she, she like she rolls the head, and the head starts talking. She rolls the head, and the head's like hello. It, it kind of sounded like Bakugo from My Hero Academia. I don't know if that's who the voice is, but it was that type of voice. Uh, and that's how the episode ends. It was super trippy and fucking weird. While we're here, uh, I am now on to the original Hef, German-style wheat beer. I don't know how much alcohol is in it, but it definitely just tastes like a German Hef. I don't know. It's all right. Same company. It's a lot of stuff in chat, but no Super Jets. No more, no more Super. Well, 
you know, maybe it'll happen between shows. We'll find out. But this is the next show. It's uh, real quick. Something I learned about and I think is kind of interesting. I don't know worth bringing up, but um, one of the uh, I think best. Um, what am I looking for? Producers slash like performers for Linus Media Group, uh, mm. uh, formerly known as Anthony, has come out as trans and now as Emily, mm. um, which is interesting. Um, she uh, is in a lot of their Linux videos. She knows how to do Linux and uh, overclocking stuff like that. I don't know. I just thought that was interesting. Well, there's a lot of trans stuff that's going to happen in this episode of Skip and Loafer. I think... Yeah. This is. I'd give it a nine out of ten. I gave this a, an eight, but it is my favorite episode this week, and this is still probably my favorite show of the season. Um, although you know, with all the episodes, just fuck all the shows that are just dropping episodes, it's hard to say what's the best because I don't know how far I am into each show comparatively. But yeah, so this episode of Skip and Loafer it starts off with uh, uh, the aunt sits now and. And Skip, Skip. Who we're going to keep calling her, because um, we're never going to remember her name. Mitsumi? Yeah, I yeah. think it's Mitsumi. Uh, um, so, uh, Mitsumi is asking Sis now for advice on... Uh, what should I dress for this date I'm going on? Well, she doesn't call it a date, but now goes like, is it a date? And she yeah. goes, I don't know. Now is very concerned about who this fucking boy is that's trying to move in. Who's this Shimososuke guy? Yeah. What's his deal? And, uh... Uh, she uh, Skip dresses up in like a country bumpkin outfit and you, looks. Adorable. You really liked this outfit. I think it's you were fun. Like, yeah, let her go with that. She, it's cause... cute. She's wearing like a straw hat, a panda shirt, a uh, flannel tied around her waist, and jean shorts. Um, I mean, this does look like something I would wear, so I'm I'm not surprised that you like it. You know, it's funny. It also looks like something I might wear if the shorts were longer. <laughs> uh, but. Yeah, the the aunt who is actually a fashion designer is, or uh, she works in fashion, is like mm, no, uh, but she considers letting her wear that because she doesn't. She's you know not sure if this romance should go through. Uh, meanwhile, Mika, I think is her name. She basically after seeing Shima with the uh, model girl that he's uh, apparently childhood friends with um, at the end of the last episode, she's like childhood friends, my ass. They're obviously banging. obviously they've got to be more than that and like she basically just thinks you know he lives the reason he's so mellow and he, he is the way he is is that he lives in this world where he's surrounded by these amazing people so you know he must just be a shallow asshole and she's disappointed basically she's trying to give herself reasons to not like this guy that she clearly likes because he doesn't you know he already has a girl uh unfortunately it's not really gonna work so our main characters, Skip and Loafer, have gone to the zoo for a date, as they said they were going to at the end of the last episode. And stalking them is not only Mika, but... So, hang on, real quick. Uh, M- Mika's stalking uh, them behind a tree and everything, and then uh, this random guy shows up and goes, Are you one of Mitsumi's friends? And I literally out loud go, Who's this dude? Um, and then it immediately becomes clear, It is Sis now in disguise. Boy boating. <laughs> I think this Transformers. might be the first accurate portrayal of boy moding as a concept that I've ever seen in anything. Uh, I was pretty happy with it. It's cool. You you got to understand. No, I don't. Nobody will. Uh, being a trans person is a strange, strange reality that you live in. Because... You understand better than anybody that the difference between being seen as a man and being seen as a woman is extremely superficial. And it's relatively easy to change that perception, but it takes consistent, constant effort. Uh, And if you're not willing to put in that effort, or if you have a reason not to, you can just kind of switch back. Uh, like that from everyone else's perspective so if speaking personally as a trans woman who i have very dark facial hair and even immediately after shaving it you can still tell that i'm a person that has facial hair you just can i've had a few rounds of laser hair removal but unfortunately you probably need to get that like totally restarted. restarted because yeah i moved out of the available range of places i could do it and haven't been able to go back so it's there's an amount of 
even without wearing makeup, because I I don't like makeup. Uh, it's it's a lot of fucking effort for not a lot of worth. Um, just through clothing, I can look feminine enough that even if you don't immediately assume that I'm a biological woman, you can pretty fucking clearly tell that I'm not a regular guy. And that's usually the state I'm kind of in, is like, oh, this person is, at the very least, not a man. I'm not sure what's going on with them, though. That's how a lot of people react to me. Other people see me and they're immediately like, oh, obviously a trans woman. Or, you know, you look enough, you are wearing clothes I would want to wear, so I'm going to talk to you like you're me, you know? Uh, as opposed to like you're some kind of foreign entity and it always comes down to how people feel about gender what they what kind of stuff they are already holding on to is like what gender means in their own minds so you know it, the, the experience of it can change drastically but if I'm in a situation where I know that people are going to see me as a man I'm not really trying to fight that. I'm not trying to be confrontational with regular people in everyday scenarios. I'm just trying to go about my fucking day. If people call me sir when I get up to the counter, I just accept it. I'm not like, no, it's ma'am. I'm just like, whatever. Yeah, whatever. I'm can sir. I have my beer? Uh, can now? I have my beer? Like, I don't care. So I just kind of accept, I roll with the punches, I let whatever, you know, how open I'm going to be with that person from that moment forward will largely depend on that perception. You know, if I walk into, the other day I, I walked into a dispensary and the first thing the woman behind the counter said to me is, I love your blouse. If I hear that, I think, oh, cool. I, you know, maybe I'll tell you where I got it. But like... Whereas me... Uh, no one even needs to say I love your blouse. It's just like, oh, well, here is where I've been for the past week, and uh, this is what's yeah. going on with me. Uh, yeah, and the uh, here are all the details of what I'm doing. You generally dispense every single aspect of your current situation. Because to I don't who like when interested. people talk to me at work, and I don't want them to have an excuse to ask another question. It's true. If you overwhelm them quickly, then they'll be like, oh my god, I need to get out of here. Uh Anyway, now has boy moded so that she can stalk uh, her niece without being noticed. And she tells Mika I'm her uncle, just to not be confusing or complicated for the time being. They go on a fucking adorable date to the They're zoo. There's seals and they see pandas, some pandas and, and stuff and other things. And they go to the food court, and then they get really hot, and so they have to yeah, chill out. Yeah, she's a while. she's a little too cute, and he's like, "Let's go to the gift shop." By the way, lovely outfit picked out by Nasan. Um, and uh, meanwhile, then, uh, these two are on their own sort of. They have like a double date kind yeah. of thing uh they're posting it on their pinsta that's what yeah. happens when pinterest and instagram have a child um but i you know they have a cute little dinner they exchange uh, now it's pretty quickly caught on to what nika's deal is she's also she's like oh on. you like him and yeah. then she goes no i just want to date a really attractive boy in high school so, uh, the first half of the episode is basically just about this date. At the very end of it, Sis now reveals to Mika that she, or before they went to that, um, place they were eating at, she revealed that she's a woman and she's actually the aunt. And yeah. Mika's just kind of like, what the fuck? Okay. I'm shitting and farting. Yeah. She, she doesn't really have a problem with it. Um, uh, so then it's sleepover time. And, yes. uh, now Chan is saying to Skip, hey, remember to tell your friends that your aunt is biologically male. Because uh, it it's really depressing if... when people act like they're surprised about yeah. it. Yeah, I, I get that. I would much prefer if people already know before I'm there, which it helps, like, for instance, meeting Bird's family, most of them had followed me on social media already, so, like, they, they, they knew at least what I looked like, don't really know how I'm going to act. So usually the reaction I get isn't like, oh, your wife is uh <laughs> looks like this it's more like who the fuck are you anyways you know and then uh usually they like me by the end but um yeah i i, I get exactly why this interaction also i love now now san's uh outfit in this scene 
so they have a big fun fucking sleepover. All the girls are here. They're all being friendly. There's a really cute scene where like the the tall beautiful girl is telling Mika like, you know, I've basically always wanted like a group of friends I could actually hang out with that would treat me normally. Uh and the dark girl, I guess I'll call her. She's just like we you don't have to make a whole thing about it. Like you don't have to be gay about it, you know. We can just be friends and not have to mention how we all wanted to have a group of friends in secret. Uh I love their whole dynamic. I like that that you know, you got the the two pretty girls and the two dorky girls and like Mika basically thought she was going to be enemies with all the girls because they're all supposed to be competing for the hottest guy. But she is the only one who thinks of yes, it this way. She's the only one, and the, she's starting to realize that, which I really Ooh. like this development with her. I forgot. There's a moment when Now and Mika are having their little pseudo date or whatever, where Now like, reminisces on uh, Mika's general personality and that she's really into fashion and that she's really striving to be uh, seen and get yeah. attention. She's like, reminds me of someone. That and actually then... hasn't happened yet. Oh, shit, really? Yeah, that's at the end of the episode. Shit. Whoops. But uh, we'll, thought... we'll, we'll, we'll explore why in a second. But yeah, um, they're all bonding. They're all having a good time. Um, the darker girl, by the way, the glasses girl. Darker uh, haired. The way that she has assimilated into this group reminds me a lot of my best friend in high school who, like, when I first met him was, like, clearly, like, you know, fucking people suck and I want nothing to do with them and, like, my life is not in a good place. And then as soon as he became friends with everybody, he was, like, super chill, always bringing the food to the party, you know, like, just, yeah, you know, it's nice. It's nice having friends. We don't have to make a big deal. We don't have to get all emotional about it. I'm just here. I'm just here to have a good time. I'm just here to hang out and eat Pocky, all right? Uh, so, yeah, I really like her character and her development. Um, and, yeah, this is where Mika is starting to realize, like, maybe I'm the only one who thinks you're supposed to be a cunt to everybody. Maybe I'm just a cunt. Uh, it's nice. It's nice to see that development. Uh, but nonetheless, she decides to leave the party early because she knows that eventually everyone's going to start talking about romance if she stays and late. She does not want to hear about Shima at all. Exactly. She's preparing herself to uh, not get her heart broken. But now Sun's kind of like, y you know, if you regret this, you can come back. And she's like, well, that would be embarrassing. But, uh, you know, I don't think she's really expecting the conversation to actually turn to romance. And then we cut to Shima and the whore. <laughs> well, we don't know what her deal is, really, but apparently... There was some kind of scandal. Yeah, they're, they're having a back and forth. She's pretty much figured out that he likes uh, Skip. Skip. She's like, you like the weird ones. And he's like... That's not nice. And she's like, yeah, you well, shouldn't talk about you people's because friends like that. You because fucking, you took so, me to a party and we got drunk and we got in a scandal and we were underage and now I'm fucking my whole career. She's sucks. still in the entertainment industry and yeah. Shima is just like at school. Basically, she thinks that she's going to be burdened with this drama for the rest of her life, which is true. But who gives a fuck? She still she's are, she even says like you think everything's fine now because I'm getting modeling jobs, but it's not fine. And it's like, yeah, she I don't know. should just become a Japanese wrestler. That would be cool. Who she would care then? Wrestler. Uh, so yeah. like Maki Ito, I would I would love to see that. I guess Mika did come back. Right? Because she's there I for guess the whole so. rest of it when they're having all their huh, I had fun not events. Even yeah, realized I hadn't thought that. about it. But uh, yeah, they're, here they all are watching movies together. I love, again, that stoic girl is just like not affected. This is like uh, watching horror movies with Tony from Hack the Movies. Oh, yeah. He'll just be sitting there. Yeah, he's... The most terrifying shit ever is on screen. He's just like, you know how they did that is actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone else is freaking out. Very cute. <laughs> Uh, I loved that episode. I loved it. It was great. It are was we at everything the, that this was? Are we at the final one? It's not the final. Okay. We have two more. I'm glad we're not ending with this. Oshinoko was the worst anime this <sighs> season that we're watching. I really... And... I, I didn't have the highest hopes for this show with its first episode being 90 minutes long. And in fact, wanted to really not watch it because its first episode <laughs> was 90 minutes long. But it was pretty okay. The problem is... Now the show is kind of in a repetitive cycle of, like, there is a problem in one episode. 
the next episode, that problem is solved. And also, these problems are not like regular problems. They're like the weirdest, most ridiculous problems ever. What do you mean? The... I want you to come down towards the... I'm not, because it's hot. Oh, okay. Um, anyway, uh, it, they're just like, they introduce these ridiculous wait, problems. right now? Oh, shit. Oh, wait, excellent connection. Okay. Jesus. Whatever, probably working. Connection said it was bad for a second, yeah. so I got scared, but um, I came back. So anyway, they introduce a ridiculous problem. The next episode, they solve the ridiculous problem. And then the episode after that, nothing happens. We're in one of the nothing happens episodes. It's, or it's, rather like... This is going to come of, down to your perspective, right? All of the consequences from the problem from the previous episode, they're gone. They didn't matter. It wasn't even an issue at all. Um. Well, this has happened a couple times. I think we should be fine. Okay, so... Man... I have to address, before we get into really discussing this episode... Thank you for not killing yourselves. Yeah, that too. Um, this is the most liked anime of this season. If we're talking about, like, popularity, scores, um, you know, people... People gave Akane, the girl from the last episode, or I mean, girl from this episode, I guess, the girl who tried to kill She's herself. She's a character now. She's just she a character. Is, she won, like, the popularity poll of, like, in the week or whatever among voters online in English-speaking territories. People are loving this show. And I understand that. I understand why people like this show. I think... There's nothing wrong with liking this show, even if you're an adult. It's I think a little embarrassing. There's a little, there's a little wrong with liking this show. <laughs> but I need everybody to understand that this is... this. We're not covering this show for people who like it. Um, the, it says we're no covered. data. We, we're, we just keep getting these I mean, no I'm data warnings, you. and I'm really like I'm just scared. I'm, I'm hearing us. I'm scared yeah. that we're not gonna be live. And it'll be, it'll I will let you know if we don't if we stop going live. But it has not cut out enough to matter. Okay, so the uh, the people who love this show, they're totally right and they're justified. They should love it all day. This is just the other voice. All of the voices need to exist. The people who love it, the people who hate it, you need to know their reasons. Maybe you don't agree with those reasons. Maybe you think those reasons are unjustified. But you know what it doesn't affect? Your ability to like the show. Our not liking the show has no bearing on your liking the show. And if you love it, man, there are people talking about what makes it good. You can go watch Kito Senpai. You can go watch Yee Man talking about what makes the show good, talking about the background information going in really deep about fucking religious symbolism and shit in this show there is stuff in this show that i totally understand liking it's not for us and i think some of you probably are only listening to this segment of the podcast literally go listen to the whole rest of it this is the only show we were negative about this week that means that there were eight anime that we enjoyed this week and this was the only one we're keeping up with that we didn't like enough that I gave it at least a 6 out of 10. So it's, it's not that we don't like anime. It's not that we're super cynical. This show is not for us. It's not our genre. It's not our wheelhouse. And we I'm only gonna... picked it up because it's the most popular anime of the season. If this show takes a really hard turn towards being about detectiving again, I might enjoy it again. But it doesn't seem like it's going to. It seems like it's going to draw that out as long as possible while explaining the most mundane concepts on Earth in every episode. I have to say, in Anonymous in the chat says, the first time I really became aware of normies was when I was walking out of the second Hunger Games movie while everyone else was giving a standing ovation. You know, Anonymous, I totally understand that. However, I just need to say it, and I'm willing to take any backlash for this. I just recently rewatched all of those movies, very good, very fun, actually very similar to the books, which I'm a huge fan of. Um, can't wait to see a ballad of songbirds and snakes. I have to say this. I love blockbuster entertainment, especially in the modern age. I think when something is successful at being pop media, that's awesome. Like, if something can appeal to everybody and still be good, you know, I think there's tons of stuff that is 
widely appealing and still of high quality and i could explain why it is and and even this show again there's a lot to like about it this episode for me is like a five out of ten uh and that's you know i give something a five if overall i disliked it but not so much that it was like painful or annoying you weren't screaming at the screen no i wasn't like wait actually you might have been there have been episodes of this show and of dead mount death play that made me angry this season this was not that level it was just like uh you know, it was like, uh, I would have chosen not to have watched any of this if I could have. Like, I didn't need this taking up space inside my brain. Um, other than in that, we could talk about it because it's popular. And again, I realize that with the show being as popular as it is, it means that the overall sentiment is positive. Most people like it. Most people want to hear someone share positive opinions of it. And those people will not be happy with what we have to say. But this isn't for you. This is for the people who don't like it. It's for the people who gave it a shot because you liked it so much, because you scored it so highly on my anime list, and so everyone who's like, well, what the fuck is this show that it got such good scores and that it's so popular, we have to check it out. And if you checked it out and you don't like it, which is obviously going to be a sizable segment of any show's audience, there's shows I like this season that other people don't like. Almost nobody likes Magical Destroyers. I kind of like it. Uh, I like almost everything else. This uh, we again this this week, everything was solid, except for Oshi no Ko. So let's get into it. Now that we've pissed everybody off, uh, Akane Kurosawa is getting roasted big time. Oh no! Kana what if here, she tries to kill herself again? Kana goes on this long winded rant about why this would be happening, why it's she understandable. She's like, like explaining the internet and social media and acting. I've and... felt this way before too, you know, even though I'm self aware enough to analyze all of these behaviors, even me, I can get depressed enough to think, why don't I just end? Yeah, I know, I get it. We all feel this way. Like, I, I don't know, when a character is backing out to a point of writing the exact comment that fans of the show are writing on my videos about, like, well, actually, you know, she's a teenage girl, and for people that age, it's going to hit them even harder. And, like, Kana is saying this. She's a teenage girl. And she's like, well, you know, and she's a teenager, so of course it's going to hit even harder. You're the same age! Like... Is it supposed to hit her harder than you? Is it because you're more of a professional than she is? Like, just the level of fucking dialogue and overthinking that these characters do. Again, about things mostly I already know. And it, it's... Uh, I, I try not to be overly cynical about shows that are talking to an audience that doesn't know things that I do know. Again, it's just not for me. You know, the fact that... It's not just that it's stuff I know, it's stuff that's like an obvious fact of life that I've had to factor in every day for 20 years or whatever. You know, like just stuff that to me seems so obvious that it's not worth mentioning is always being mentioned in this show. Hmm. It, it just feels like they never made an assumption that the audience would already know anything. I don't know if it is intentional. I'm just on the Dead Mount Death Play wiki and reading trivia about Akane. Uh, it says, Akane's story in the Love Now arc, which is the one we're in right now. You said whole... you were reading the Dead Mount Death Play wiki. Uh, sorry, I, I, I inserted... I was very confused by that. <laughs> I inserted a, a bad show name. In... <laughs> so sorry. I'm on the Oshinoko wiki. Uh, Akane's story in the Love Now arc resembles the circumstances surrounding the real-life death of Hana Kimura, a Japanese professional wrestler. Kimura committed suicide in May 2020 due to media pressure after getting embroiled in a controversy in the reality dating show Terrace House. Uh, while Akane's suicide was prevented at the last minute, Kimura's wasn't. Yeah. Um, I don't know, just interesting. So yeah, they, they talk about this shit for a while, and then um, turns out somebody saw this attempted suicide and called the police. So now both Aqua and Akane are in custody. 
she's understandably breaking down crying in front of her mom because she you know never told her anything and the mom's just like what the fuck is going on uh aqua's legal mom is called in they're all having a powwow and then this scene really annoyed me and um the show is going to explain exactly why this is happening but i hate it so only the other cast members show up to akane's hospital room where is her manager where is where anyone is her, her mom is there i think her, her, does she have a dad no is there anyone else in her family who might give a shit where are the show producers or directors that question's kind of going to be answered basically the answer is they're all callous assholes who wanted this to happen but none of them would have at least tried to look good by showing up None of them thought it might protect their image. This is... Sometimes shows are cynical in a way where I'm like, you're almost not cynical enough. Like, I think it's important to recognize that most of the good that happens in the world is because people are performatively trying to seem like good people. Like, if people weren't trying really hard to make other people think that they're okay they wouldn't try that hard to be okay but like generally if you come off as a big asshole or a sociopath all the time people don't want to work with you and think you're a piece of shit and like the attitude that the people running this show seem to have based on this episode which isn't the impression i had gotten when the main character met the producer i guess uh you know in the beginning who asked him to be on the show um like, it, the impression that these guys gives is, like, well, nobody would work with them again. Like, and maybe that's why, I mean, I guess this show, it's it's all teenagers, so if they're just producing this same show and they're getting a new batch of teenagers in every year, maybe it doesn't matter and they can just grind through them. There are definitely TV product Dr. Phil, that guy doesn't care about the people who are on his show. I don't, you know, I mean, like, some of them. He must care about some of them. I think for the most part, they are just, you know, whoever is getting filtered through the grinder of this show next. But someone along the line is the one who has to manage those people. Like, it, I would assume on a show like this in real life, probably each of these characters would have someone from the show who is assigned to be their personal attendant to, like, make sure that they're on script you know like the whole time for what they're trying to do that person would have been here it's just it was unrealistic to me that no one no one showed up except for all of the other cast members it's it's one of those things where uh, i have a big problem with sparks i'm gonna make it this a thing I'm, I'm really gonna go after sparks as my next target and maybe a lot of people don't know what this is, but in wrestling terms, a mark is somebody who believes the storyline, who just full-heartedly believes the, uh, like what the characters are saying is happening in the story. A smark is somebody who realizes that all that stuff is obviously, you know, dumb bullshit, but buys into the fake meta narrative that is also being promoted as though it's real and think that like. If anything is being shown to you, it's calculated. Like, if you... This podcast, right? Like, I think about what I'm going to say on this podcast before I do the podcast. I go through the episodes. I select the clips. While we're watching the shows, I think things. I think, oh, I'm going to say this. And then I find a screen cap. And I think, oh, I'm going to say this at this part. And there's obviously a, a lot I of... I am seriously considering... And not because of any failings I think I have on the show, but purely because I just bought some really nice pens <laughs> starting taking notes on this. I've um, considered it a few times. When there's stuff I forget, like talking about the music, which I never remember to do. We're eight episodes into all these shows, and I still never given like a real rundown of their music. But, uh, you know, for the most part, obviously there's plenty of ad lib. I don't think of every single word I'm going to say on the show, but like there's a direction I'm planning. There's a style that I want it to have. There's a difference between the way I would talk on here and the way I would talk you know, in a, a regular conversation. So to me, it's not that it's fake per se. Uh, this show did a good job of explaining it in the last episode when the girl's like, you know, yeah, I really do have these opinions, but I'm playing them up for the camera. 
The problem is that the show understands that but also is buying into aspects of the unreality of reality TV that are still fabrication. It feels like this show is made by somebody who's a big fan of entertainment and the entertainment industry and has read a lot and studied a lot but still thinks more of it is real than it really is. And that's what I would call a smark. Somebody who, you know, keeps convincing themselves that the people at the top are being sincere about something. When, like, the reality is you cannot make it to the top without a level of detachment and a level of understanding of, you know, where you can plug sincerity into a broader scheme of deliberate action. Um, (sighs) Yeah, so anyways... (laughs) Uh, here's the the producers, the production staff who fan the flames, and the netizens who say whatever the hell they please. These netizens, are the, the bad what a guys. Ha- the fucking portmanteau. Uh, so basically, what Aqua decides to do to combat the negativity towards Akane, because I guess he's just invested now. Uh, it's because he's you know he 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 knows how easily people can die, having seen his mom's death. Whoa. So he wants to make sure this girl doesn't kill herself. So he starts a whole campaign of highly publicizing her suicide attempt. Like, hey, everybody, you made this girl want to die. Don't you feel like shit? And, uh... No, they don't. You know, he wants to turn her reputation around. So he talks to the director, and uh, the director is just like, hey, man, you know, everybody just wants to see people fight in a way that seems realistic. We didn't coerce her into anything. She was just being herself, man. We're the weirdest part the of cameras. all of this is that Aqua kind of goes, yeah, you're right, but also, you're an asshole. Yeah, Aqua's like, well, how old are you, mister? And he's like... Uh, I think he says he's 30 oh, or so. Oh, right, because he he's 35, but he, he calls Akane a professional. And uh, yeah. Aqua basically yeah. goes, no matter how professional someone is, a 17-year-old is always going to make mistakes. Yeah. It made me upset because I, I remembered that um, almost exactly what he says in this scene, not unlike what Kana said earlier, is what commenters were saying in defense of our criticisms of Akane on the last episode. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. Like, the text of the show is not unclear to me. I'm just complaining about it that I don't like it. Uh the characters going over it and explaining again and again why it makes sense is... You don't need to tell me why your story makes sense. If it makes sense, it makes sense. You don't have to go into fucking eight minutes of telling me why the things happened. I get it. Uh, Do you get it? I I think so. I hope so. I'm sure fans of the show will tell me how much I don't get it. Um, Basically, Aqua decides, all right... Fuck the director, fuck these guys. What we're going to do is we're going to compile all the footage we can, find all the moments where it looks like we're all being friends, and we're going to reframe this whole show as if we were all like actually buddy-buddy and they were fucking us <clears> over <throat> trying to make us look like we hated each other. Tall and boys win again. It's we are changing the, the story. story. The story has changed. They managed to get 74,000 retweets in 24 hours, which is a that's a fucking high number. Retreats. That is a really fucking high number. Uh, so yeah, it all works. And then they're having this moment where they're all hanging out. And they basically ask Aqua, what's your ideal woman? And he starts describing all of the traits of I, of course. His mom <laughs> that he was in love with before and she was his And simultaneously his mom and his mommy, if you will. Yeah. Although he is older than she was. And uh, the weird girl with the devil horns is like, oh, it sounds like you're describing I. And Akana is like, that idol who died a long time ago? And she's like, yeah, she's basically exactly that person. And so Akane is like, well, since Aqua saved my life, I am going to dedicate myself to becoming that woman that he's obsessed with. And then we get a little montage of her doing that, uh, learning all the things she in, like. Uh, in like the she creates a Pepe way. Sylvia board. Yeah, this is the most disturbing. I, I mean, I think this might be the second time a Pepe Sylvia board has I've referenced in an Oshinoko. How do you think we are supposed to feel about this character? 
uh, like she's I don't, mentally she's, yeah. ill, right? Like she, uh, like the suicide ideations so, and the awkward personality aside, she, like Heath Ledger, is an amazing <laughs> actor. Yeah, she's totally like off the deep end at this point. Um, she's obsessively researching I, learning all of her mannerisms. Uh, she quickly fi- like. Through her psychoanalysis of I, she concludes seemingly on her own that she must have been fucking as a teenager. She's like, all of her behavioral patterns are those of someone who was fucking as a teenager. But it seems like she calmed down when she was 16. Maybe she started getting that good dick. Like, this is her <laughs> surmising about what like happened with I. She's just on point. Everything she studies, she knows. But she's basically... This is the funniest and maybe my favorite thing that's happened in the whole show so far, actually, is her coming to the conclusion that she needs to figure out how can I be like her without being a slut at, like, a young age? Like, how can I imitate everything I does without the sexual trauma? Slash coming off like a psychopath. Oh, well, you know, she's... Definitely coming off like a psychopath, but she has the star eyes at the end of the episode. Also, we learned that I was unclear if they were talking about her specifically, but I guess she's like a famous stage actress. Actually. Yeah, she's a really good actress. Yeah, she's she's sucked on this show because it's a reality show, but actually, as an actress, she is apparently stunning. This has never been brought up. The whole last episode where she was getting trolled by the whole internet, she had nobody stepping up to defend her, even though she was already a beloved and popular actress. Because they've been trying to paint it like it was just this innocent girl who nobody fucking knew about. And the whole impression of her is just that she fucked over the more popular girl. But actually, no. She's a beloved fucking stage actress. Nobody said anything to defend her. This is unbelievably unrealistic and annoying to me. It's like for let's say for example Kevin Spacey went on a reality TV. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh I really hated that they suddenly See, retconned that joke that works she's because like, he's both a stage actor and a very scandalous human being. <laughs> I hope this bitch becomes a scandalous human being. Right now, she just... I mean, I guess... She doesn't. Does she have Yandere energy? Is that what they're going for? Do they want her to seem like She's not trying like to a... kill him. She's just scary. She's a little scary. Uh, I thought the fact that they made her quite so scary did start to redeem her a little. She became interesting, finally. Yes. I was not interested in her at all, based on the bullying bullshit, based on the suicide attempt... No, I didn't give a fuck about any of that, but learning that she's like a psychopath, now I'm a little more interested, and I really hope the next episode picks up, because this was so boring. This episode was mostly just monologue on monologue of characters psychoanalyzing one another, sociologically analyzing culture, all through like a very narrow, cynical lens, really not that much perspective on how the industry works. And I just thought it was annoying. Uh, again, I get why people like this show, but please watch Shiro Bako. Watch fucking Sore Ga Seiyu. Watch uh, Animation Runner Kuromi. Watch anything else about the industry before you watch this show. And you will definitely ha- watch fucking Perfect Blue. Somebody said this show was Perfect Blue for Redditors. I thought that was really, really funny. Uh, Perfect Blue is an amazing film, and uh, yeah, it's a lot of a, a lot of David the same Lynch themes. Thing? No, uh, but it feels like a David Lynch thing. Okay. Uh, you're thinking of Blue Velvet. I see. Uh, I'm Perfect use Blue the is an anime film by the guy who did Paranoia Agent. It was his oh. first movie. Uh, Bird doesn't like the first episode of Paranoia Agent, um, which, in retrospect, I will say, feels a lot more obvious than it did at the time. Um, I don't know if that's because I was young or because psychology was just so much less of a topic uh, in the mid-2000s. Dr. Stone is the very last anime that we've got to share with you all, and it was a solid episode. This this arc has been... Um, 
slimming out the cast hilariously in the previous episode was a great move because it allowed us to have our our main team kind of establish themselves more. We ended the last episode with them doing this. They didn't show this in the last episode, but they, they like shot nerve gas at them, right? They did show this in the last episode. Did they show this whole pose with the... Uh... Yeah, yeah. Gen jumps down on the ground okay, and then yeah. Senku starts like turning shit. Yeah, they show this. I, I gotta say, I really appreciate this show... This episode is gonna like really lean in, just like the last episode did, on uh, Kohaku and uh, Senku shipping. But also, this imagery, to me, is for the Gen and Senku shippers, and I I really think they wanted oh. the I, I think they wanted these two to be like options, you know, like different audience members are gonna want one or the other, but both ships feel highly relevant to me. It's like hey. Senku, who do you pair him with? The obvious straight choice or the obvious gay choice? Anyway. Gen could be a woman. Gen can be whatever you want. No, no, I'm be. saying Gen could be a woman. Maybe, oh, he, like, he, maybe he is just such secret. a good uh, mentalist. Yeah, we literally could not know. Um, so we flash back to like five years earlier and the 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 woman who has been betrothed to the guy who's like in charge she's not even betrothed to him it's just like there is a system in the village where every year or so the guy who is in charge of the village comes down and picks the most attractive girls so we see this flashback where she was with this group who were like hey Fuck this island. Fuck always having to do stuff or else we get turned into stone. We're just going to, like, build a raft and go off. So they start doing that. And then the the, the, the man in charge and the woman who is, like, his right-hand woman, I guess, they are chasing after them. And he spots the girl in the back. And he's like, you know, that 13-year-old girl... I can tell she's going to be really hot in, like, five years. And the other woman's like, you're a pedophile. And he's like, that doesn't matter. All that <laughs> matters is having beautiful women on your arms at all times. That's the only meaning of life. So we're going to petrify the rest of those guys. But make sure you throw the petrification stone far enough that it doesn't uh, affect her. So basically... No, no, say, no. Not intentional. No, he does. He tells her, like, throw it like throw it far enough in the air that it won't reach to her. No, he doesn't. He does. He says make sure it's like off like he's no, intending no, no. to have he... her not get frozen. No, he isn't. That I'm, I'm to be pretty what he sure said. that's not what it is because they didn't anyway. He is only telling her to raise it up so that it actually hits them. Like, I he's thought just he was trying, trying to... to spare the kid. No. I mean, a good rule of thumb with anime, and it doesn't apply all the time, Mm -hmm. they're going to literally say what they're doing most of the time. That's true. I think it was literally just a, her aim was a little off, and he was trying to figure that out. He's the spotter, she's the thrower. In in any case, uh, they froze everybody but her. She got away, and, uh, you know, obviously he wanted her from the beginning. So she tells this story to Senku, and he pretty much figures that as long as there is any kind of rules controlling this petrification beam, that means it's science. And that means, we, or rather, this is how I win. <laughs> if it's a science battle, we can't lose. This moment reminded me a lot of No Game, No Life, which is one of the anime I've compared this show to. And um, No Game, No Life is the show that I, I considered like central to my thesis of the otaku hero's journey in which I present the idea that there's always a a mad scientist, which is the person who can imagine how the future is going to be changed, and then a living computer, which is the person who actually solves the equation for how that's going to happen. And what's interesting about Senku is that he is both. Uh, he doesn't have a... He's obviously a mad scientist, but he doesn't have a living computer sidekick. He is the living computer. He's just the ultimate dude. Uh, You could say in a way that Ryusui kind of fills the space of what I would have called the mad scientist role with Senku being the living computer to that. But I I really think that what makes Senku not necessarily an otaku hero, but just a science hero, is he's not 
schizoautistic. He's not like a, a weirdo that puts people off in any way. He's not divorced from society. He's like a very functional, very normal engineer that everyone loves and respects as soon as they meet him. He's a leader. He's a natural. You I know, think he's more of a gallon. <laughs> so I, 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 you know, even though he literally falls into the exact tropes of the otaku hero, which is basically thinking that. Because you have the logical ability and the imagination, you can solve all of the world's problems without killing anybody and, uh, you know, and, and be the hero. And, and Senku is that exact combination of traits, and Sora in No Game No Life says almost the exact same quote at the start of that show. Because basically Sora and Shiro are like, we win any game we're a part of, but the real world is a shit game where the logic doesn't make any sense. <laughs> But if we're in a world where everything is governed by logic, we will definitely win because we're the best at logic. And that is Senku right in this moment. Big science hero energy. Shit game poop play. <laughs> uh, so basically, they're, they, they need to make Kohaku win the cutest girl in the village contest so that she can go meet the, the guy. Um... They're like, you gotta change your clothes, and she just starts undressing. She's like, yeah, these guys don't care. Uh, they do. Kohaku's the best girl. You know, she doesn't understand how hot or how unhot she is. She has no idea that she could be hotter by wearing makeup or outfits or whatever. And makeup doesn't really exist, also. Yeah, and it, and it doesn't really matter to her that she is hot. In the first place, you know, she's really just a warrior. She's just kind of a lunkhead. Um, I, I love her. They put her in a cute outfit, but Gen is like, this isn't enough. The, pr the problem is the face and the attitude. It's that her personality is unladylike and unattractive. Uh, there's a hilarious scene where she hears something and is about to run off and then realizes he has tied a rope to her wrist. Well, no, it's that um, they break chrome. Mm. The, the the guy with the huge yes, hat breaks crumb. Yes, and she wants crumb. to run in to, to, to do something about it. Uh, but yeah, the... I just... The relationship of Gen, Senku, and Kohaku. I really like the chemistry the three of them have together. Um, They're cute. And yeah, here's... Crumb uh, is legally dead. Uh, well, what, I mean, they're all... Our, they're all legally dead. One of our like main ass characters. But yeah, everybody on the ship has been frozen, but we see Krom broken as a statue. Like uh, as we know, the revival fluid can can fix all wounds when you get brought back. So as long as you repair the statues, they're fine. But uh, for now, Krom has been beheaded. That's pretty fucked. It's pretty crazy what's going on in this arc. Um. So. Kohaku is trying to scout to figure out how she can get closer to the boat, and then the woman who's like the second in command of the Kiri island, um, who I guess is just naked under that uh, no very sheer outfit. Who Kohaku? No, look the other woman. Like you can see the fr like you can see her body. No, through she's the... not naked. I mean, she's wearing stuff. We've seen her full outfit. What is she wearing under there? You can see her whole entire body. That's her back. This is her front. This is her tits. I don't think That's so. her pussy. Yeah, this is her ass. This is her front. Mm. She's coming towards Kohaku. She's coming. She's coming towards Kohaku. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, yeah, she's attacking, and Kohaku just starts screaming. We just need the lab. All we want is the lab. And then because, Senku pretends to be lab. Yes. Well, she knows that none of these people have ever heard of a lab. They don't know what the fuck she's talking about. But anybody who knows what a lab is will know that she's in danger and that she's yelling about it and try to help her. So, yeah, they come running and uh, she, mentalist Gen con, you know, convinces them that lab is Senku and she's just so desperate for Senku, so she pretends to make out with him. It's actually secretly not happening, but I mean, look at this. Come on. Come on! Uh, I really like it. I like that they're pushing this ship so hard. You know, this show needed some kind of sexuality in it, I think. Yeah. Well, other than, uh, 
There had been some, I can't remember her name, Rurika? Uh, Kohaku's sister, the priestess. Mm. She had kind of been sexualized yeah. for a little bit there. Um, Yuzuriha and... Sure, there's, there's relationships that are going on. I just think, you know, uh, Senku, you know, he's always uh, up in his science mind. He probably would never try to pursue a relationship, but the fact that Kohaku... And she's not, you know... We don't even know if Senku's ever anything. kissed anyone before. This could be his first kiss. This well, is probably she's, she's only, both first kiss. She's not actually kissing him on the lips, though. She's like... Kissing him on the cheek. Yeah, like pretending uh, for the for the angles. So then we get a little flashback that explains that when they when the bad guys froze everybody uh ryusui and i can't remember the archer kid's name ukyo ukyo they both quickly realize that whatever this thing is it functions like a grenade so ukyo manages to shoot an arrow at it that knocks it just high enough up that they have a second to prepare uh ryusui being the badass that he is uh realizes he's going to die pretty much and goes who can i save and he fucking kicks suika in the back of the head (laughs) and goes live on suika live suika tell them that we're fucked over um and then ginro uh he's underwater to investigate something that they had picked up on the radar he sees this happening and uh just swims down as far as he possibly can i really do think that um the creators of this manga they really wanted us to like Ryusui as much as Senku. Like, I think they... You know, science is the core. He I, has his own special marking. It's a yeah. different color. He has his own he marking. Is, he's he got is, his own episode that's like four episodes he's long. He's the only character that's been introduced that is even half as significant as Senku. Yeah, he he um, is like immediately the number two guy. And then Francois is like half as significant as Rio Sweep. And and actually, I, think, I wouldn't even say that. I think Francois is probably a little more significant. I think what it comes down to is is most of the characters in this show either fill fulfill a distinct utility, like uh, you know the obvious example would be Taiju. He is the strong guy that Senku needed from the there's start. There's a couple strong guys. There's Taiju, there's Magma, there's that girl. I don't yeah. remember her name. but uh, uh, yeah. Yuzuriha The power is, team. Yuzuriha is the uh, um, the tailor. You know, like you have all these characters that have, a, again, is the mentalist. Does she sing? Um, but most She's of them... She's the tailor? Yeah. I, the era's tour? Most it's happening of them right now. don't necessarily stand for anything. Like they have a you, they have a purpose, but they don't have a theme or like a core identity. Senku stands for science. He is science man. Krom is like his backup number two. Like I'm science man, but I don't know all the stuff you know. But you know, there was the spirit of science carries on even in people who don't know shit. Ryusui stands for capitalism. He is the spirit of money, no, the spirit of greed. Wrong. He's the he sp- stands for greed. Okay, regardless I feel they of are different. Yeah. He is just greedy. Because, you know, capitalism, I mean, to some extent, is like getting one over on the other guy you're competing okay. against. Ryusui is greedy because he wants to he wants uplift the people that are helping yeah. him. He is gre- so greedy to the he, point that he is greedy for other people. He's like the ideal wealthy person. Like, he's what we Which all Which is to wish. say, non-existent. Right. He is the, the heroic ideal of, like, a capitalist hero that uses it all for good in a way that like idealistically is how you know somebody like that would be but i really think that the authors of this manga wanted kids to look up to ryusui as much as senku and in order to do that he has to be extremely heroic like for being his characters that he's the greediest man in the world well and they accomplish the whole heroism thing just by like you know at least once an episode he goes ha ha and that's pretty yeah. heroic of him. Well, I mean, the fact that his he thinks he's literally about to die, and his first thought is, who can I save? So it's like, that's as heroic as anything anybody could possibly do in a story. I'm about to die. Who can I save? You know? Uh, literal superhero logic. And, of course, he picks the child. So, yeah. Uh, Suika and Ginro made it through this situation. Ginro Ginro's to be a in fucking dumbass. Uh, he, so, um, 
this this whole sequence we're going through right now of who survived is because uh, Senku, with the whole lab thing, they're like, someone must be there. Yeah. Someone must have survived. But we're going to get the shot that you're doing. Okay, good, good, good. Ginro swims aboard the ship, uh, and there's actually a pretty great moment where he finds his brother turned to stone and, like, runs he's back really through sad. his memories of everything that happened in the show with him. And it's just like, oh, my God, he's, you know, he's fucking... Yeah, it's it's a good it's moment. It's depressing. It's a good way to sell the this whole thing. This show this season had not really like captured recaptured the Doctor Stone energy for me yeah. until like right now. Yeah. Like this sequence, not just him crying, but just this whole sequence. Yeah. It's finally here. We're back. We're doing science. There yeah. is an enemy. Something's happening. So this was a fun scene and then uh there's this fucking hilarious moment where they're they, they, I think he gives some kind of signal to them. He's like, hey, I'm over here. And they look over at the ship. And they peer over and they go, someone's over there. Look, someone's over there. And Senku looks with his telescope and then yeah. just is immediately crestfallen. And They're the, all like, oh, no, it's him. And it's it's Gin, uh, Ginrodaza. I, I love this moment because we, of course, immediately understand why they're having this. And reaction. Amaryllis is just like, What's what? wrong with uh-huh. him? And they explain. They explain. There's nothing exactly wrong what we are with thinking. him. Yeah. It's not that he sucks. It's that everyone else was so amazing. If we had any of these A class people, it would have been so great. They literally like bring up trading cards as a comparison. Yeah. Um, it's and then uh, such a shown. It's jump revealed moment. that Suika is there, and Senku's like, "Oh my god, yes. hope Suika is the S <laughs> card we needed." <laughs> That's really great that Sweek is an S compared to Ghidro. Um Well, because yeah. she's a spy and a forager. I think that's how he describes her. So this, like, I guess the third in command of the bad guys is this man with a ridiculous hat. He's second in um, command. Well, he's, the girl is second in command. No, she's the best fighter. I see. Well, he, he is second in command. He, he's she, Jafar. She tries to say some shit to him, and he's like, "Well, technically, only that other guy can say yeah, anything he about anything." Her. And she's like, "Well, fuck you." Um, the the way they make this man scary is that he notices the barrel that has Gino moved is a in. quarter of an inch. Yeah, he's like, "That's not exactly where I saw it before," and you're like, "Oh man, he's really observant. This isn't good." Uh, so Ginro's freaking out, thinking he's about to be found, but then they hear a noise. Everybody's like, what was that noise? So they go down into the ship to investigate, and they find a bunch of goats. And they've never seen goats before, so they're just like, oh, what are these fucking things? This is neat. But of course, secretly, it was Suika who's hiding inside of her melon head amongst all the watermelons. The master of nature and infiltration, as she is called. And, uh... Yeah, basically Suika's gonna save the day. She she declares at the end of the episode, it's it's all on me. I'm fucking ready to do it. And that's pretty much it. We did it. We finished in in three hours, almost exactly, all of the Have we anime. watched anime? We watch anime. Oh my gosh. Do so we have any more super chat? Next week there's gonna be Hell's Paradise. There's going to be Kamikatsu. Kamikatsu, the shows that didn't come out this week. There are no more Super Chats. But thank you, everybody, for coming out and listening to the live podcast. I will have the edited version out probably, I'm going to say tomorrow afternoon, because I don't think I'm going to stay up late enough to... No, and I'm going to be hijacking the computer to play Overwatch. Yeah, I have to edit and upload it, and that'll probably take like six hours from whenever I wake up. So we're going to say tomorrow afternoon... There will be an edited version of this podcast that even if you did listen to this live stream, I would highly encourage you to play again because we need those watch hours. As soon as we hit 4,000 watch hours and we get approved for monetization, this channel is going to be abandoned. This is supposed to be an archive channel. There's not supposed to be a weekly live stream show on this channel. This This is nonsense. Uh, I'll make a a video properly announcing that this show is on. Thank you again to our patrons. Our bonus episode, we also have to uh, watch all of Bochi the Rock and record a video on that tomorrow. So that will be our day. And remember, anime forever. Anime forever. Thank you, everybody. Buy us a house in Kansas City. (laughs) Good.